Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, this will be the first class of our Creation Science 101. My name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years. Now, for the last 10 years, I've been an evangelist, and I travel full-time and speak on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Let me tell you how this class got started. Uh, about several years ago, uh, I had my son, Eric, showed an interest in creation science and went off to college to study creation science because he wanted to help, you know, spread this uh, information on creation and evolution. And when he graduated, he came back to work on my staff. Uh, and then Mike came to work for me about a year and a, a little over a year ago, I guess, came to work on my staff. And they've been going out speaking, doing seminars on creation and evolution, sharing my material, basically. I've been gathering material and speaking on this topic for a long time. And several months ago, I met with them and I said, hey, fellas, we ought to meet once a week and, you know, discuss uh, information and bring people, you know, keep up to speed on new developments and things like that and go through my seminar real slowly and give you an opportunity to ask any questions you want, chase every rabbit that we, you know, jumps up as we walk down the trail. And so I told some of the folks on my staff in my ministry at CSE, Creation Science Evangelism, uh, what we're going to do. And several of them said, man, I'd like to come to that. And so I called Preacher and I said, Preacher, I got several folks on my staff who would like to do this. Do you want to see if any, any church people want to do this? So he announced it in the church and, well, here we are tonight. <laughs> so this is uh, the first. Here's the goals, okay? The purpose of the class, as far as I was concerned originally, was to help equip Eric and Mike to do uh, a better job and learn all the material. They say what I say in my seminar, but I'm not sure they always know why they say it and, you know, the, the science behind it. Plus, we've got folks in my office that answer the phone and take questions all day long, and it'd be good for them to uh, uh, have more information. How many of you in the room tonight work for me? Okay, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, plus me, nine. Uh, we have about 20 all together in our staff now, and it's an honor to have the rest of you come here. How many go to this church, to Marcus Point Baptist Church? Nearly all the rest of you. Okay, how many do not fit into either of those categories? Okay, we've got five or six there, too. Well, great. Well, we're glad you're here. What uh, we're doing for this course, we're going to videotape this because I get people all over the country that say, you know, do you, are there any courses on creation I can take? And this hopefully will be something they can take via video. The class here is going to meet the next 10 Thursday nights in a row, with one exception. I'm already booked to do a debate on one of the Thursday nights, and so it's about five weeks from now. I don't remember the exact date. Do you have that, Heidi? March, March 9th, it'll be a Tuesday instead, that week. Okay, Tuesday night, that's the only, otherwise it's 10 Thursdays in a row. The folks taking the course by video don't care about that. <clears throat> anyway, that's the way it's going to be, March 9th. Okay, I have in front of me some craisins. This is the equivalent of a raisin made from a cranberry. Which week is it, which, which date is going to be on a Tuesday? Who knows? March 9th. All right, Eric, you get the craisin. <clears throat> Ever since he was knee-high to a grasshopper, we have had family devotions, and we always gave out raisins or pieces of apple, and we would have Bible quizzes, you know. Who, who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. There we go. He remembers that from, what, long time ago, don't you? Mike, where were you on that one? Don't you know? Was it... Was it John the Methodist? No. no, it was John the Baptist. There we go. All right. <laughs> We've done hours and hours and hours and hours. We played that game, giving out raisins and apples and fruit, and uh, we tried to make uh, our devotion time exciting where the kids couldn't wait. Okay. purpose of this class, then, is to equip people to know what they believe and why and be able to answer the skeptics and scoffers uh, who have belief in evolution. The Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspire means to breathe in. Heidi, write that down. That'll be a quiz question. Heidi's going to be the secretary, keep track of the grades. Several colleges have indicated they, that just because they know me, I guess, they're willing to take this credit that we're going to offer if somebody wants to later apply it toward a college degree at some other college. They'll say, yeah, we'll accept the credit. Uh, Marcus Point, uh, I think he's going to call it Marcus Point ba Baptist Church Bible Institute. I have a name about that long. We'll see if we can get that shortened up a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> several colleges have already said they will, and I'm sure as I contact others, they will uh, say no problem. So the word inspire means to breathe in. That'll be a quiz question. Heidi's going to keep a list of just questions that, and at any time during the course, we will simply use those questions uh, for quizzes, and then at the end, all of the test questions we get will come from previous quiz questions. 
I don't like, I don't like surprise uh, tests. I don't like people to sneak up on me and, you know, study these 30 things and then they test you on 30 different things. <laughs> you won't get that out of me at all, okay? I taught 15 years and I despise those kind of uh, classes and teachers that want to try to make somebody fail. I want everybody to learn. <laughs> That's the object. We, we have a, a word in English called expire, which means to breathe out. That's when you die. You breathe out. The word inspire means to breathe in. And the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. This book is God's word. Now you should have gotten tonight a notebook. If you did not get one, raise your hand. This uh, notebook will come with the course. It is just my regular seminar notebook that I give out. Why don't you keep a few spares back there? And as people come in, Heidi can get those to them. Um, one of the things I want you to do during the course of this 10-week uh, course is read through the notebook. And I'd like, I'd like some input on this for, I guess, a selfish reason. I want you to see if you see any mistakes in there. You can be my proofreaders because we're going to print, uh, what, 5,000 copies of this coming up soon. We don't want any typographical errors. And also, if you see anything that's totally missing from the book, you say, Brother Hovind, you ought to have a section on whatever, you know. We, can say, we print the notebook ourselves and can simply add sections to it. So if you see something that might be interesting or you see something that's not in there that we discussed that you say it ought to be in the notebook, just make a list or make a note and hand it to me and we will add that. So the Bible says that the scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for doctrine. The word doctrine means uh, what, what we teach on, what we believe on a particular topic. There are different Bible doctrines. There's the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of eschatology, which is, you know, future events, what's going to happen in the future. There's all sorts of different Bible doctrines. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice there are four things given there. Two of them are negative and two of them are positive. And this is the excellent sandwich method of teaching. If you want to say something negative to somebody, you sandwich it in between two compliments. Boy, you look great today. Now, you did a lousy job working yesterday, but uh, we know you can do better tomorrow. <laughs> you sandwich your negative in between two positives, and that's the way the Lord did it here. It's profitable for doctrine. That's teaching. That's good. For reproof. Well, that's, nobody likes to be reproved. For correction. Nobody likes to be corrected. And then for instruction. Another positive at the end. So that's the sandwich method, which is an uh, interesting way of teaching that a lot of parents need to learn, <clears throat> including myself. I don't always do that, but uh, that's what you try to strive for. So if the scripture is profitable, and in Revelation chapter 1, it says there's a blessing to those that read and to those that hear. Just reading and hearing God's word will provide a blessing. It'll nourish you. By the way, if at any time you have any questions or want to comment or talk further on to some, or something, don't understand something, raise your hand, and we will uh, uh, be glad to stop and take your question. Okay, which Tuesday night are we going to meet? All night. March 9th. There you go, brother. All right. You get a crazing. Okay, very good. Uh, what does the word inspire mean? With it. Ooh, that was close. Who got that one? Becky? Okay, there you go, Becky. Steve is drooling now. He wants one. Don't share it with him. Uh, let's think of another question. Never, I, th I answered it myself. Never mind. <laughs> we did that all the time, ever growing up. Um, so if God's word is inspired, if it's breathed by God, well, then we better pay attention to what it says. He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he breathed into his word. This is inspired of God. And I tell folks in my seminar, I start off when I do my seminars, and I'm the purpose of this is to teach you guys how I, how I do my seminars and why. One of the things I do, I have a lot of visuals normally, dinosaurs, charts, posters, bright colors, this keeps everybody's attention this way. People who speak or teach without visuals, I think, are failing to, to grasp, to get all they can into the students, okay? Visual, a picture says a thousand words or more. All of my Bible verses that I use, you notice, are on my computer, and I hit a button, and they go up on the screen. When a pastor stands in front of the church and says, turn in your Bibles, half the folks aren't doing it, right? So if there's a blessing in Revelation chapter 1 to those who hear and to those who read, they're only getting half of the blessing because they're only hearing it, they're not reading it. And so I want to make sure all the scriptures is bang, right there on the screen, and you can see it for yourself. The second thing I'd like you to notice that I do, and the reason for this, when I do scripture verses, if it's more than a few lines, I try to have different colors on there. 
I always highlight a few words in the verse. I try to get a few in the middle of the verse if possible, though that's not always possible. By putting some color in the middle, it makes it faster to read and for the brain to absorb all this information. This is just called a mnemonic device. Mnemonic is a memory, a memory tool. I don't know how to spell mnemonic, and that won't be on the test since I don't know how to spell it, since I taught science, <coughs> not spelling. But uh, memory devices are incredible, and the more of those you can get in your life, the, the, it's an unbelievable how much your brain can retain if you learn to use mnemonic devices. For instance, you're learning the names of all the Great Lakes. There are five Great Lakes in America, right? Simple mnemonic device to remember them is the word Holmes. H-O-M-E-S. Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior. That's called a mnemonic device, something to aid you in memory. Some waitresses work very hard at that. You know, they can walk up to your table with ten people there, don't even write a thing down. What would you like, sir? What would you like? What would you like? What do you want to drink? What do you want, you want cheese on that? And, and they come back and get it right. My wife sends me to the store for a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk, and I have to call home from the store. Bread and what else was there? <laughs> I just don't get it somehow. But a mnemonic device used when you're, when you're presenting material is to have, for one thing, maybe six lines maximum on my screen. Uh, six or seven, I try to do less the better. Big font, something they can see a mile away, and have some color in there. So if all scripture is given by inspiration of God, one of our jobs is to be ready always, the Bible says in 1 Peter, to be able be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you. We have the truth. If this is God's book and we are supposed to be teaching it to others, then one of our jobs is to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, like Second uh, <laughs> Timothy chapter 2 says, uh, brain fade, it's been a long day already. Uh, our job is to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, and to be ready to give an answer. And I'm afraid in the last 150 years, the Christians have not done a very good job of answering the skeptics and scoffers about the evolution theory. Had the Christians defended the Bible just like it says it 150 years ago, we wouldn't have this problem today with evolution in our schools. Even in 1925, in the Scopes Monkey Trial, Darrow, the atheist, got uh, William Jennings Bryan on the witness stand and said, how old is the earth? This thing's to that, words to that effect. He said, oh, the earth is probably billions of years old. Right there, he blew it. At that time, in 1925, many Christians had accepted the great age of the earth and tried to incorporate it into their theology. And that is just the beginning of your downfall, as far as I'm concerned. The Bible teaches very clearly the earth is about 6,000 years old. We'll get into more of that later. So one of our jobs is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that is in you. Something that helps you memorize faster is called a mnemonic device. Steve, Dan, you're dying for one of those, aren't you? Eric, that's three. We're going to get you taffy next time, keep you a little busier chewing for a while. That helps, by the way, in devotions. Give the kid taffy instead. <laughs> then they can't answer the next question and gives the other kid a chance, especially a big wad of taffy like that. I tell folks in my seminar, there's a war going on. Everybody ought to find something to do, okay? If you're not going to shoot, at least carry bullets. Everybody can do something. Very early in my seminar, as I present, I try to use humor, get people laughing, because when you start speaking and a certain percentage of the people aren't listening yet, they're not quite cued in, okay? But if everybody starts laughing, those that weren't paying attention, what are they laughing about? <laughs> right? So the sooner you can use some laughter or a story to get started, like I tell the story of my brothers, which I'll sh share with you in just a minute. The reason I do laughter and stories is it grabs people's attention. And if you just get up and start preaching, I mean, that's great, I'm for preaching, but you need to preach effectively, do it right, okay? Um, I will say at this point, when I say there's a war going on, if you're not going to shoot, you can at least carry bullets, then I say, God has a plan for everybody. Everybody can do something. Even the worst of you can serve as bad examples, if nothing else. <laughs> if that's God's calling on your life. I'm a bad example of <laughs> what to be. And that gets folks laughing and, oh, that's right, that's probably me. You know, I could be the bad example. All right. Um, and I tell, I tell people, I show this picture and I say, this is not my wife. 
This is just a picture of her. And of course, they can all equate with that. And I want folks to, I want to be personable with them, spend some time, and here's me, here's my family. I'm an ordinary fellow like the rest of you, you know. And it kind of brings you down to, uh, you can listen to me. I'm where you're at also, okay? I'm not some high and mighty. I, I, before I finished my doctor's degree, I was one course short of finishing my PhD. I put it off for probably eight months. I really wrestled with it. Should I even finish? Because I knew if I got that doctor's degree, it would alienate me from some people. It's like, oh, wow, doctor, you can't talk to him. Well, anybody on my staff or family can tell you, I'm really about fourth grade level, okay? <laughs> you have to grow old. You don't have to grow up. That's been my philosophy for years. And I intend to be a kid as long as possible. Finally, I decided I would finish the degree because I felt like it would open more doors and let me reach some people that I couldn't reach otherwise. But I don't think you have to have any degrees. You know, everybody can reach somebody right where you are. You could start a class right now in your neighborhood teaching on dinosaurs and bring all the six-year-olds in, right? They don't ask questions about carbon dating and potassium argon dating and all that stuff. They just want some adult to talk to them and explain how dinosaurs fit in and how the Bible is right. So you don't need to wait until you got some big bunch of degrees behind your name so they call you Dr. Fahrenheit. Um, just get started on something. Just do something. Now, when you're steering a car, if the car isn't rolling, turning the wheel doesn't do any good, does it? You're still facing the same way. Get rolling. Do something. Then it's easy. For one thing, it's easier to steer. Okay? I think it's easier for God to guide a Christian that's doing something. People often say, did God call you to this ministry? I don't know. Honestly, it just needs to be done. That's all. Just go do it. And somebody needs to reach the kids in your neighborhood. So then I'll say, I live in Pensacola, Florida. And I try very hard in my seminar to have as many pictures as possible. There's now about nearly 3,000 pictures in my seminar uh, in the 15 different hours that I give, 15 different sessions. And I have a map, Pensacola, Florida. Because if I just say that, people are, some of the people in you know, Australia, when I'm speaking over there, well, where's Pensacola? You know, they barely know where USA is. And this gives them a map and a picture of Pensacola, Florida, with an arrow pointing to it, right here. So it's goof-proof, okay, or at least idiot-resistant. Um, then I'll say I have three kids, one of each. And at that time, you find out who's really listening and who's not. A few of them say, oh, one of each? How can you? <laughs> What's the third one, right? Uh, Marlissa is my youngest. She'll graduate in a few months uh, from uh, Tennessee Temple. Going to come back and be on our staff. And then Ken Andrew works here at Marcus Point in the video department upstairs. And then Eric, right here, is married to Tanya next door. Raise your hand there, Tanya. How long have you been married now? Seven, seven months and twelve days. <laughs> oh, brother. Um, and Tanya's brother, Vitaly, also is on my staff. Vitaly, raise your hand. And Jan, her other brother. Jan and um, Tanya do video duplication. They make the copies of the videotapes. They'll be making copies of this tape. And then uh, Vitaly, what, what do you do, Vitaly? Do you do anything? Okay. He runs our printing press, and he's also been translating all of my material into Russian. He's from, their family's from the Ukraine. And we have uh, five out of seven parts done, and the, other com the other's coming quickly, right, Vitaly? Right, as soon as possible, <laughs> getting everything into Russian. We want to reach, get the gospel over there. Um, then I show them the family portrait. Again, here it's, you know, down home, here's me. And if you're going to, you guys, I assume, have your own family portrait, you stick in there. Right. Then I go right into what I want to cover. There are four great questions in life. Every religion in the world tries to answer these four fundamental questions. And these will be quiz questions. What are the four great questions of life? So how do you write that down? The questions are, who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? Now, if you think about it, atheism tries to give an answer to those four fundamental questions, don't they? The Buddhists try to give an answer to that. Every religion is really a worldview, a way of looking at the world. Roland, did you get a notebook? No. No? Who's got this? Heidi, you got the spares there? Hand one back there. Roland. 
And I show the questions first. I don't dwell on it long. I don't even normally give them long enough to write it down because I go right into the fact that there are two ways to answer these questions. Two opposite ways to answer them, depending upon how you view the world. And the two world views are people who look at the world and say, it's amazing. A Big Bang made this from nothing. That's called the humanist worldview, which basically says there is no God, so we must be God because we're the highest evolved creature. That's the humanist worldview, which I have here. The evolution or humanist worldview of history it says it all began 20 billion years ago. It just created itself. There is no creator. The other worldview is people who look at the world and say, well, it's incredible design. There must be a designer, a very smart designer. That is called the creationist worldview, which I have right here, the creation worldview. These are basically the only options. Somebody made the world or nobody made the world. There, there's no other options. Now, if you believe somebody made the world, then of course there's a lot of options within this category. Was it Allah or Buddha or Jehovah or, you know, who was it? Okay, that gets into a whole other argument of which God made the world and when did he make it and how did he make it is another set of arguments. But basically I'm settling it into two camps. Either there is a creator or there isn't a creator. And so that kind of gets it, lays the groundwork for where I'm going to be going with my seminar. I say there's two worldviews. And which of these views you choose to adopt will determine how you answer the four great questions of life. And these two worldviews, creation and evolution, are absolutely at war with each other. Charles Darwin's book was written in 1859. That'll be a quiz question. When was Darwin's book written? 1859. Okay, what date's on a Tuesday? We have a meeting? March 9th. Steve, you're on the ball. Oh, March 7th. Give that back. Uh, you, 7th. There we go. March 7th. Okay. You get a crazy. All right. There we go. And what I'll do each week is we'll keep adding to these questions. Eventually we'll stop using that one as a question. Uh, but uh, we'll keep, and just out of the clear blue, we might be talking about one subject and bang, ask a question about something from last week. That's always been my method of teaching to keep, it's a constant, really, it's a constant review so that by the time you take the final exam, there could be 800 questions on there. It wouldn't matter. You get them all right. That's my idea of, of testing. Yes? Did Darwin only write one book? He wrote several books. The first one that he wrote uh, was called, has a, back in those days they had long titles on their books. Okay? Like sometimes a whole paragraph was the title to the book. It was kind of the custom of the mid-1800s. And we'll get into a whole lot more on Darwin's book. Darwin, strange fellow in many ways. Uh, his grandfather was a doctor, a uh, medical doctor. He really came up with most of the evolution theory. Pass another book back there, Heidi, if you would. Uh, give her some more there, Eric. Erasmus Darwin was a medical doctor with a real hatred for Christianity. His name was Erasmus, E-R-A-S-M-U-S, -E -S, I think. Erasmus Darwin wrote a lot about evolution. I forget the name of his book. I could look it up. Something about zoology or something like that. And, uh, but the world wasn't really ready for that. That was in 1802 when he died, I believe, or when he wrote his book, somewhere in there. We can look up the facts. But when Grandpa Darwin wrote his book, at that time, the world was still strongly influenced by Christianity. You know, our founding fathers, for instance, were strong believers in, at least in God. You know, Jefferson was a deist. He wasn't a Christian. But uh, one more back there. Is that the last notebook? Oh, she's got them. Okay. Um, and so Erasmus Darwin was a medical doctor, and his son, I don't remember Charlie's dad's name, but he was also a medical doctor. Charlie showed no interest in much of anything except shooting birds. He just loved to go shoot birds, and just, he, was a, he, he liked to play, basically. All of his life, he just liked to play. Never did want to settle down to anything. So it, it took Darwin like 30 years to write that book. And the title is, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. A big, long title on the book. And we'll get into a whole lot more of that later because it's very important. But uh, <coughs> Darwin, Charlie Darwin, hated birds because he loved worms. I'm telling you, the guy was a real screwball, okay? 
Uh, he hated women. He hated blacks. He hated anybody that wasn't, you know, uh, like him. We get into more of his racism later, which we cover on my video number five of my series. I show all the documentation. Another thing I try to do in my seminar, when I show a picture, I try to put right at the bottom the documentation. Where did this come from? That saves me an awful lot of phone calls. Hey, where'd you get that information? I don't know. Look on my slide. <laughs> When I taught school for 15 years, I would always put the week's homework up in the corner of the chalkboard for every class. I had a little graph that stayed up there permanently. Okay, here's math class, here's biology class, here's earth science class, here's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Here's your homework for the rest of the week. And because kids would always call me at home, what's due tomorrow? I don't know, go look on the board. Even if I knew, I wouldn't want to tell them because then I'd have to do, you got, you got to do that the rest of your life. Eventually, you've got to wean them off of it, depending on me, okay? It's been on the board all week, you know, write it down. So that's uh, another teaching tool that I picked up from somebody. Anyway, Darwin's book was written in 1859, or published in 1859. There seems to be quite a controversy about this. 1,200 volumes were published, 1,200 copies. All of them sold first day. So it looked like, wow, a runaway bestseller. It appears that the truth of the matter is a couple of rich folks arranged to have all of them purchased on the first day so that it would look like a runaway bestseller. But actually it wasn't. The book was, it's boring. I mean, try to read it sometime. It's a real boring book. He's a lousy author. He rambles on and on and on. He can't tell where he's going. The title is The Origin of Species, and he never does discuss The Origin of Species. Never does get to it in the book. He <laughs> just rambles on and on. It's one of the most boring books you'd ever want to read. But when the book was reprinted a hundred years later on the anniversary, they asked a man named Sir Arthur Keith, who was a strong believer in evolution. They said, Mr. Keith, we would like you to write the foreword to the 100-year reprint of Darwin's book. Arthur Keith wrote the foreword to the book on the 100-year anniversary, and Arthur Keith said, the conclusion I have come to is this, the law of Christ is incompatible with the law of evolution. Nay, the two laws are at war with each other. And anybody that fully understands this controversy will have to agree there just is no compromise. Either somebody made the world or the world made itself. There just is no compromise between the two. And evolution, when you finally boil it down, there, it, it does not have room for God. Its purpose is to exclude God. Who can name at least one of the four great questions of life? Who am I? Who am I? Another one? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? Becky, is that the, you said that? There we go. And somebody else said it too. Is that you over there? Oh, oh stepped. Am I still plugged in? I stepped on my mouse tail there. Okay. Four great questions of life. And the way you answer those questions is determined by your world view. Now, at this point, I go back into the four questions. Who am I? And what am I worth? Then I say, now, if evolution is true, if this theory is true, what are we worth anyway? Nothing. We're a bunch of chemicals, right? That's all we are is a bunch of chemicals that got together by chance. You're nothing but a piece of protoplasm that washed up on the beach one day. To make it worse, you're part of the problem because you are one of the polluters of the environment. Now think about it. If evolution is true, then the way it's supposed to work is a species is supposed to get up to a certain population level, and if there are weak ones or inferior ones, they should be killed off. And the reason we got these folks going around trying to thin down the population or wipe out, you know, a genocide, you know, my race is better than your race, so I'm going to kill all of you, is because of this evolution thinking. Because if evolution is true, honestly, folks, we aren't worth a thing. There is no value to human life. And you get people who believe that, like Joseph Stalin, leader of Russia, who killed 60 to 100 million people. Or Paul Pot, the leader of Cambodia, who killed half of his entire population. Half of the country was killed. Well, if he believed in evolution. Hitler was a strong believer in evolution. And so, who are you? You're not important. Really, this, this philosophy of evolution is not just a dumb theory, folks. It's dangerous. 
And I've dedicated my life to exposing the ridiculousness of this theory because I think it is not just dumb, it is indeed dangerous. Because you're not worth a thing if evolution is true. You're certainly not important. Second question, where did I come from? Everybody wants to know this. I mean, that's why they had the famous movie Roots, you know, where did I come from anyway? Well, let's go back before Roots. Let's go to seed. <laughs> okay, where did, where did we come from anyway? If evolution is true, we came from a big bang. Now, where did that come from? Well, they don't know. They're searching for the answer. <laughs> there is no answer, okay? If evolution is true, we came from a, and I, at this point I try to throw in some more jokes. I say, we came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. We just got belched into existence. The universe did. Why am I here? Everybody would like to know what's the purpose of my life. Doesn't, kids don't have to get very old and they start wondering, what, what's my purpose? You know, why am I here? And then I say, if evolution is true, there is no purpose to life. So you might as well have fun. Eat. Drink and be merry, tomorrow we die. What was the famous uh, beer commercial years ago? Uh, get all the gusto you can get. You only go around once, you know. And honestly, that is the correct answer if evolution is true. If evolution is true, how do you tell right from wrong? What is sin for that matter? There's no such thing as sin if the evolution theory is true. Because after all, we're nothing but a bunch of chemicals. The strongest really ought to survive. So the people who act that way, like Joseph Stalin and Paul Pot, they're just acting out their philosophy. That's what they believed all along. All right, half hour. Everybody stand up, turn around twice and sit down. Night classes, you got to do this. Vitaly, did you wash your hands? Yes, sir. Here you go. Go around, give everybody. Okay, fourth and final question of the four great questions of life. Where am I going when I die? Everybody realizes we're mortal, we're going to die. So this is an important question that everybody thinks about. And every religion tries to give an answer to this. What do the Hindus teach in their worldview? Well, you're going to be resurrected into something else. You know, you're going to be uh, reincarnated. Everybody has an opinion of what's going to happen to them when they die, don't they? Do you think some of those opinions are wrong? Yeah, most of them, right? So one of our jobs as Christians, if we believe we have the truth, then our job is to teach everybody else what that truth is. It's a battle of worldviews. And we're trying to get them converted over to the creation worldview. Now the Bible says, in the beginning, this is actually an amazing verse. I want you to look at it carefully. There are 10 words. In the beginning is a reference to time. Time has three dimensions, past, present, future, right? Where can you be, where could you possibly go to escape time? There's no place you can go. Time permeates everything, right? Just like God permeates everything. You cannot escape. He is all places at all times. But God created time, right here in this verse, in the beginning. See, a lot of people have this idea that God is stuck in time like we are. No, 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 God created time. He's outside of time. The person who creates the computer is not, he's not the computer, he's not even in the computer. He's outside of the computer, he's above and beyond the computer. That is evolution at work, folks. By the way, when you're speaking, stuff like this will happen. You might as well make a joke out of it, okay? And that's always a good one. I was on the radio today doing a radio talk show, and the uh, phone system went dead in the middle of somebody calling in. And so I said, well, folks, uh, according to evolution, things get better automatically. Black tape on this poster looks really good, I'm sure, doesn't it? We'll try to do better for next week. <laughs> somebody help him. Is that level? Up on this side. Okay. Is that right? That's good. Okay. It's Eric. I'm sorry, son. Why would I question, right? <laughs> Chip off the old block. Another thing I noticed, when you put up your displays, fellas, put them up straight. Make a big deal out of it, okay? 
It looks sloppy when you walk into a church and, you know, posters are crooked. I make a joke out of it with the kids. When I have kids help me put them up, I say, now here's my poster and there are seven, eight possible ways to put this up. Seven of them are wrong. And I put it upside down, sideways, backwards, you know, <laughs> eight different positions. This is the way I want it right here. Oh, okay, Mr. Hovind. And make a joke out of it and you get the kids to help you. Um, okay, in the beginning is reference to time. People often say, well, if God made the world 6,000 years ago, what did God do for billions of years before the creation? And this is the answer I give is the answer you have to give on lots of those type questions. I will say, your question assumes that God is stuck in time like we are. So there is no answer to your question because your question is based upon a faulty assumption. Does that make sense? You're thinking God is stuck in time. Just because you're stuck in the year 2000 doesn't mean God is in the year 2000. Before the creation, there was no time. It goes into a different dimension called eternity. Now, the human brain cannot comprehend that. There's a lot of things we currently cannot comprehend. Our brain just won't stretch that big. I tell people, if, the, if I could understand God, He wouldn't be worth worshiping, would He? Think about it. If God would fit in my three-pound brain, <laughs> He's not very big, is He? I tell people, it's not the things I don't understand about God that bother me. It's the things I do understand that bother me. <laughs> it's the same with God's Word, okay? There's a lot of things about it I don't understand, and I'm working on them. The things I do understand bother me. I'm not doing all of them. I don't know if anybody else here is having the same problem, but I would assume that's the case. Okay. <clears throat> there are two different ways of looking at the world. These are known as worldviews. Brother, world you've got one back there. Can you? There we go. Two different worldviews. Uh, what are the two different worldviews? Creation and evolution. There we go. Right. Okay. We're going to go, except with one exception, how many Thursdays in a row for this class? Ten. Dan, you finally got another one. There you go. You look like you're starving over there. Okay. Huh? Or oh, nine more. I said with one exception, there'll be ten weeks in a row. Right. So I got that. I'll eat that one. <laughs> So, in this verse right here, in the beginning, it's a reference to time, every religion has a story of how we got here. The evolution has an in the beginning, don't they? In the beginning, Big Bang. Every, you have to have that. Where do we start? Now, after people say, we sing songs, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years, that's not true. I mean, it's a neat song, and I like the song, but folks, it's just not true. We're not going to be there 10,000 years. We're going to be there. <laughs> I don't understand it. I can tell you about it, but it doesn't mean I understand it, okay? <laughs> He's actually going to stop time. There shall be no more time. And before time, there wasn't any time. So once upon a time, there was a time when there was no time. <laughs> Think about that one. And time is a trinity, three dimensions, past, present, future. The illustration I used to, to help people try to understand this, I don't know that our brain could ever understand it completely, but if you get in a raft and go down Grand Canyon, you're going around all the curves in Grand Canyon, you know, going downstream, over the rapids, all this stuff, you're in the raft, you cannot see very far ahead of you, and, you know, maybe there's bends in the river and you don't know what's coming next for sure. Let's suppose we get, somebody gets in a raft and they has to head down Grand Canyon. A couple hours later, somebody else starts down the canyon. A few hours later, somebody else starts down the canyon. Here are these groups all spaced out through the whole canyon. None of them can see each other. That, that river going through the canyon is like time. Now let's suppose I am in a helicopter way up over the top of the canyon. And I have a radio and I can talk to anybody in any of those rafts because they have radios. They cannot see each other, but they can all see me. Okay? because I'm not in the river. I'm above the river. Does that make sense? I can see the person that got in and that's, you know, been there three weeks. I can also see the person that's just now getting in. I can see them both at the same time. God, right now,
can see 400 B.C. and 2000 A.D. I don't claim to understand it. I just, that's the best I can do to illustrate it, okay? God sees it all. He already knows what's coming around the next bend for you. Now, you don't know, and it's a little scary going through life. What's going to happen next? Well, God knows. So if I was you, I would stay on that walkie-talkie and say, okay, uh, which way do I go here? And if he says, stay to the right, well, then stay to the right, because he sees the rapids coming that you don't see, right? So the whole secret to the Christian life is stay in contact with the Father and say, which way do I go? Keep me in the right position so I don't mess up. From where you're looking, it might look better if you stay to the left. But he sees something you don't see. And if he says stay to the right, well, then just trust him and stay to the right. So this verse is awesome. In the beginning is a reference to time. God created the heaven. That is a reference to space. Space has three dimensions, length, width, and height. Where can you possibly go to not be in space? <laughs> there's no place you can go, is there? No matter where you are, there's a coordinate for you, a length, width, and a height, right? We're stuck in it. Just like time permeates everything, so does space. Now, if there wasn't any time, then there couldn't be any space either. These three, time, space, and matter, is called a time-space-matter continuum. If you want to study a lot more on that, there's a great chapter on that topic in Henry Morris's book called The Long War Against God, which is a great book. We don't sell it. Our ministry, you can get it through ICR. We could offer it, I suppose. We could order it if somebody wants it. Uh, a tremendous book, The Long War Against God. And he goes off on a rabbit trail there talking about the time-space-matter continuum. It's really tremendous. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Earth is a reference to matter, physical, material world, which also happens to have three dimensions, solid, liquid, and gas. Now, you can get a superheated gas called a plasma, but it's still basically a gas, okay, just extra hot. So we have a trinity of trinities in only ten words. Only God could write a book like that. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if that verse is true, that gives you a particular way to answer the four great questions of life. Who am I? I'm a creature of God. Where did I come from? God created us. Why are we here? Must be to please Him if He made us, right? I mean, if He made us, it must be for a reason, and we better find out what the reason is and do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, no, that depends on God since He's the Creator. So I better find out what He wants and do what He says. It really answers the questions of life right there, the four great questions. Now, Satan came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. People have asked the question for years, you know, when did Satan fall from heaven? We'll get into more of that later, but apparently sometime between the creation and Genesis chapter 3, Satan had decided people ought to worship him. My theory on this is, since Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, and that's really the first date we have to go on, as far as, you know, any dates in the Bible. 130 is the first number given. Before Seth is born, they had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Okay? Who was their third son? Seth. Seth. Who got that? Who else got it? Who else knows it? Hey, Vitaly, go give everybody a crazy again. Okay. Give him the whole bucket. He washed his hands yesterday. He said, okay. In the back. Okay, give them one. <laughs> We're out of notebooks. We'll bring some more. For those that just came in late, um, the seminar notebook will come with the course. You give Heidi your money. Heidi, raise your hand there. And give Heidi. Oh, you got more? Okay. You've seen these before? <laughs> and Heidi will be keeping attendance and keeping grades and stuff like that for me. Kind of the class secretary. Who did not get a crazy? And you need some more, Vitaly? You got enough? You didn't get one yet? Are you a good catch? Ooh. Three second rule. Now, if it's on the ground for less than three seconds, there's no germs on it. It takes them three seconds to jump on. <laughs> oh, yeah, plop it in there. Now, if you come off the bottom of your shoe, they probably already have germs on them by then. 
All right. Mm, man, those are good. I got them on an airplane sometime a few months ago. I thought, man, this is awesome. Have you had them before? I don't know why I never heard of them. I guess I travel too much. Okay. My theory on this is that God made everything in six days, so Satan was made as just one of the created beings. He was a cherub. He was not an angel. There are several different types of heavenly beings. There's angels, seraphim, cherubs, uh, the four and twenty elders. I'm not sure what they all are, but there's, not, there's more than just angels that God made. It appears, and people argue about this, the study is called angelology or something, but um, it appears that the angels were given one opportunity to choose to rebel. A third of them did and followed Satan. Uh, the, the theory goes that probably after God made Adam and Eve and made everything, Satan was the, or Lucifer at the time, was the choir director, directing the praises. Everybody's praising God. Everybody's having a wonderful time. Boy, God, you're the greatest. And Adam and Eve are praising God. Everything's fine. And Satan thought, you know, that's a pretty nice world down there. Those people ought to be praising me. After all, I'm smart. I'm handsome. I'm intelligent, et cetera, et cetera. And it describes him in Ezekiel chapter 28. It says, you know, he was from the day that thou wast created. And we know from comparing that with uh, Job chapter 38 and other verse, verses that Satan was, everything was created during those six days. Some people are going to teach that there was a pre-Adamic civilization that is totally unscriptural, unscientific, and unnecessary. The whole purpose of that pre-Adamite -Adam civilization is to try to make the Bible say the earth is billions of years old, and the Bible doesn't say that. Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments is real clear. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And there's a large movement of Christians, or so-called Christians, who are running around saying, you know, there's a pre-Adamite rebellion, there's a gap theory, there's a day-age theory. We'll get into more of that later. Those theories, I think, are unscriptural and, I think, dangerous. Because now you're going to have death before Adam sinned. I mean, if there's a pre-Adamite world, what happened to them? They'll say, well, they died when Satan fell from heaven. Now, this is what I was taught as a young Christian. I had a Schofield reference edition, which teaches the gap theory. The Dakes Study Bible teaches the gap theory. Um, uh, many TV evangelists now are going around speaking the gap theory. Well, Hagee, what's the guy's name? Hagee. He did a whole big long series on the gap theory. He calls it a gap fact. I'm sorry, it's just not true. Genesis 3 is the first reference we have of Lucifer being a bad guy. At the end of chapter 1, the last verse, verse 31, God looked at everything and said it was very good. Would it be very good if the devil had already fallen by then? No. Here's the clues we have. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Before that, Cain and Abel were born. No dates are given. Before that, Lucifer was out as a bad guy. So I tell folks it might have been 100 years before Satan fell from heaven. Could have been. We don't know. Anyway, Lucifer came to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The first sentence we have recorded, and there's a principle in Bible study called, uh, the study of, it's called hermeneutics. I don't know who made up that word about that long. But uh, hermeneutics is how, the science of studying the Bible. There's a law called the, mention, the first mention principle. The first time something is mentioned, or the first time a character appears, that's important. For instance, the first time somebody lied to the Holy Spirit, what happened to him? God killed him, right. Now, he didn't kill him every time after that, but he did the first time to get the message across. This is how I feel about it. The first time somebody broke the Sabbath and picked up sticks, what happened? They said, kill him, stone him to death, right? And they did. Now, I'm sure that didn't happen since, and it happens every day. You know, now people <laughs> break the Sabbath all the time. And, but the first time it happened, God said, kill him. The first time somebody touched the ark that wasn't supposed to, Uzzah, what happened? God struck him dead. This is called the law of first mention. So here we have the first mention of something coming out of the serpent's mouth. What's the first thing he did? Question what God said. Try to raise doubts. And there's three D's here that makes a good acrostic if you want to preach on this. There's he raised doubts, doubt, denial, and deification of man. That'll be on the quiz. Three things 
uh, the three th the three lies that Satan said, or three statements that Satan made. First was a question. Yea, hath God said? He's raising doubts. By the way, many liberal churches today do the same thing. I'm convinced one of the purposes of all of the wild versions we have going on, you know, people say, which Bible's right? You know, which one's right? Well, just the fact that there's 30 or 50 of them out there raises doubts of what did God say anyway? We can get into that controversy if you'd like, take a long time, go off on that rabbit trail, but I stick with the King James for all sorts of reasons. And I think you might want to look at the website, avpublications.com, if you can get on the internet and see a comparison of all the different translations and see how many words they left out in some of the other ones. Just av for authorized version dot com and see Gail Ripplinger's website. I've talked to her just last week and she's in Virginia or West, what? Virginia. Uh, but anyway, the, the pr first princi principle here of first mention is the first thing Satan said was a question. The question is designed to make Eve doubt. The second thing he said to the woman Verse number 4, Genesis 3, 4, Ye shall not surely die. Now he's just flat denying what God said. God said you'll die. He said, no, you won't. A lot of churches fit into this category. <coughs> Some of them just question God's word. Well, we're not sure what it really means here, so we'll just, you know, interpret it for you. Did God really say, you know, homosexuality is bad? Well, you know, we're not sure about that. <laughs> Read the Bible, okay? I don't want to go off on this rabbit trail too far, but <clears throat> I think we got a lot of Christians out preaching against homosexuality, and they should. But they're not preaching against lust, or adultery, or fornication, or letting adulterers into your living room on the TV. I mean, it's easy to preach against somebody else's sin. We better look and preach against our own also. Read Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality and how wicked and vile it is in Romans chapter 1. Then you go to chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, Thou art inexcusable, because you judge another, you're guilty of the same thing. So we're real good about preaching about Romans 1. Well, you better read chapter 2, the first verse also, because we're just as guilty. Uh, D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon were great preachers of the past, and they were good friends. Well, Moody weighed 300 and some pounds, and Spurgeon smoked cigars. Moody said to Spurgeon one day, you ought to quit smoking those cigars. Don't you know that's a bad testimony? When are you going to quit anyway? Spurgeon poked Moody in the belly, said, when you get rid of that. <laughs> they're both right, and they're both wrong, right? So, first thing he did was question God's word. The second thing he did was deny. So first is doubt, second is denial. And a lot of churches, liberal churches, will deny that God said anything. They don't believe there is a word of God. My church that I went to, the Methodist church, after I got saved, I went back and asked my preacher if he was saved. He said, what do you mean? I said, are you going to heaven? He said, I don't believe there is a heaven. Folks, you would be shocked at how many churches, how many pastors question God's word or deny God's word. They don't think there is any way to know what God said. Now, if we don't have God's word, how, how are we going to know right from wrong? Doesn't it make sense, just from a logical perspective, if there's a designer, there's probably an owner's manual. Doesn't every complex machine come with some kind of owner's manual, what to do with it? Doesn't mean people read it. I get a computer program, it's got all these books, I don't read it, I just tell Brian, I, tell, explain it to me, would you please? <laughs> okay. Explain to me how this works. And I think we'd be wise to look at this logically and say, okay, there must be a designer, everything in the universe is designed, and there's probably an owner's manual. And I happen to believe, after studying for 31 years, that this is it right here. I believe God has given us His Word. So first he raised, he, he doubted God's Word, then he denied it. The third thing he said was, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. This verse deserves study for a long time. There is so much packed into this verse right here. Let's all stand up, turn around twice again, and sit down. It's been a half hour. When did we get a full, the whole Bible in English? That's a good question. I don't remember um, the answer to it. I took a course in, in Bible college called Systematic Theology, where you spend, you go into all that stuff. You know, why do we have these 66 books? Why not the other books? 
uh, how do we know which book should be in the Bible? And that, that's an entire study called theology. I don't remember the answer to the question of when we got it finished with the 66 books that we have. In order to determine which books went into the Bible, there was a series of tests that they had. Uh, if, if Jesus used it, then that was good enough for the Old Testament. So that was settled. So which version of the Bible of the ones available in that time did Jesus use and refer to and say, this is the Word of God? So that said, the Old Testament was not too difficult to settle. Uh, the New Testament, there's... I'll, I'll tell you who would know the answer to that is that website, avpublications.com. They could tell you the date when we got it and all that kind of stuff. And the different manuscripts, the families of manuscripts, the Alexandrian and the Byzantine and the Texas Receptus and all that. That's an amazing study. Let's look at this verse for a minute. God doth know... What he's saying here, what he's subtly saying is, Eve, God's holding something back from you. God knows, but He doesn't want you to know. That's the implied message here. God knows in the day you eat of this, you're going to be, your eyes are going to be opened. In other words, they're not open now, which means basically you're dumb. I'm smart. You're dumb. This is the exact same attitude you get every debate I've ever done against an evolutionist, that attitude comes across very clearly. And I guess I'm getting old and crotchety, but I don't tolerate it at all. I was in a debate last week in El Paso, Texas, and the guy got up and he said, now folks, evolution is a complex subject and you know, probably you know, most of you can't understand it. I said, folks, let me translate what he just said. What he just said is, you're stupid, I'm smart. Isn't that what he meant? You can read the letters to the editor that they write, or the, the nasty websites that are out. There's about 137 websites now that are just anti hovent <laughs> I have really stirred up a hornet's nest. <laughs> it's, and it's funny to read them because the, the tone in almost all of them is, you know, the reason Hovind draws such large crowds is because, you know, the average person just doesn't understand science. What's he saying? We're smart, you're dumb. That's it, folks. That's what it boils down to. And right now, the atheists will drive past churches on Sunday morning, see the audit, see the car parking lot packed with cars, and what are they thinking in their head as they drive past? Look at all those stupid people. <laughs> Aren't they? This attitude comes from Satan. Right here. God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, look at the next verse, next part, knowing good and evil. In other words, Eve, I know God told you not to eat off that tree, but if you will, you will gain knowledge. You will be enlightened. Lucifer means the enlightened one or the light bearer. He's the light bearer. Lucifer was original name, his original name. And he still tries to bring people this idea that you just follow me and I will give you more light. I will give you more knowledge. You will be enlightened. That's why on the back of your $1 bill, I don't think I have a $1 bill. My wife got to my wallet. Uh, but on the back of a $1 bill, you see the little pyramid on the back with the little eye on top? That represents Lucifer, the enlightened one. Thank you. I'll take up an offering here. Uh, this is a satanic symbol on the back of your dollar bill. There's a long story behind that, which I get into in seminar part five, about how this symbol got on a dollar bill. It was ordered to be put on in 1933. Interesting year. It actually made it on in 1935, and we cover all that on video number six. But Lucifer promises more knowledge. Think about um, the different organizations. Let's take Masonic Lodge, for instance. What do they promise? You come to our meetings, you learn these secret handshakes, you learn these secret stances, you, lis you listen, you get more knowledge. We will enlighten you step by step, degree by degree. It's the same lie from Satan. Mormons in the Mormon church, they don't tell you what they believe until you've been in it for years. You'll have to be in there for a long time before you find out what they really believe and why. The average Mormon coming in, he doesn't know what he's in. You have to slowly grow and, and you know, graduate to get the higher degrees of knowledge. Anything that's run by Satan is going to be this way. He's going to promise 
God's holding something back from you. God doesn't want you to know. Now, look at this verse. Uh, who can find Romans chapter 16? I don't have the verse in front of me. Romans 16, I don't know the verse number, but God said, or Paul said, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Romans 16, where's that one? Simple concerning evil. Romans 16. Eighteen? Nineteen. There it is. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. All through the book of Proverbs you see him refer to the simple ones. O oh, ye simple ones, turn in and gain knowledge, and turn in and gain wisdom. Get wisdom, you know. All through Proverbs you see that, the simple ones. The word simple means unpleated. They tell me when you make a skirt, and if it's just a straight skirt, it's real simple to make. But if it's a pleated skirt, it becomes much more complicated to make. A pleated garment is much more complicated to build, or to sew, whatever they do to the garments. Uh, <laughs> construct. And Solomon, writing the book of Proverbs, writes to the simple ones, those whose life is not complicated. You've probably figured out by now, the older you get, the more complicated life gets. Not only, you know, when you're a kid, all you basically got to worry about is, you know, brush your teeth, you know, take a bath when they tell you, and go play, right? <laughs> As you get older, more and more responsibilities come in. You're going to get a car. Wow, I can't wait to get a car. Well, you, when you get a car, that's great, but life becomes more complex. Now you better learn to change oil in your car. That's something else to think about, isn't it? And check the tire pressure, or else you're going to wear the tires out. And then you get your own house. Now how complicated does life get? Whew. Now you got to check the furnace filter, and you know, it's, the older and the more junk you accumulate, the more complex life gets, right? I heard, uh, who was the guy who ran for president? Ross Perot. He said, those guys with those big giant yachts. He said they're not happy. He said, go down to the dock where they got their big yacht. And they're cussing and screaming because some pump doesn't work. You'd be better off to not have the yacht. <laughs> the more stuff you get, the more complex life gets. And the Bible says right here in Romans chapter 16, God would like us to be simple concerning evil. And I think this is a concept here that I think it's, it's ridiculous for our school system to be teaching kids about drugs and sex education. People, everybody says, well, they ought to know about this. No, they shouldn't. Keep them ignorant. Keep them simple. You teach a five-year-old sex education. Why on earth? First place, he's not interested. Okay? And he shouldn't be. Let him be a kid. And I get worried. Some people have this attitude that we ought to study evil. You know, you ought to spend time studying all the drugs in the world. No, forget them. I wouldn't recognize heroin if I saw it. I don't know what it looks like. I mean, I've seen the white powder on TV. It was so sugar looks like that and flour. I don't know. what. I couldn't tell if I saw it. And I'm happy that way. I think it'd be wise to be simple in evil. But here Satan said, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's promising more knowledge. At this point, he is promising, You shall be as gods. That's deify mankind. There's the three Ds. Doubt, deny, and deify mankind. Now, many churches fit into this category. The Mormon church would be in this category. They believe you get to become God. I have here, it's the Mormon doctrine from the book Gospel Principles, 1988. He said, exaltation is eternal life. The kind of life that God lives. He is a creator. Look at that now. We can become gods, capital G, like our Heavenly Father. This is exaltation. Here's what the Mormon Church teaches. You learn step by step, degree by degree, pretty soon you get to become God and start your own universe. Now, they don't want you to know what they believe at first. If the average person comes and visits the Mormon Church and says, you know, what do you guys believe? Oh, we believe the Bible. 
We believe in God. They won't tell you about this. Tell you've been in it for a while. You have to be, you know, initiated into the higher knowledges here. A great book, the best one I know of, is the book Mormonism, Shadow or Reality. It's about that thick. I've got it at home. It's every single doctrine of the Mormon church spelled out very clearly and showing how it's unscriptural. Now, the average Mormon is, a, honestly, they're nice people. I've had a lot of neighbors that are Mormons, and I'm not just anti-Mormon. See, you've got to learn to separate between the people and the doctrine. They're great people. What they believe is satanic. It's, it's from the devil. It's wrong. The book Mormonism, Mama and Me, Thelma Greer was raised in the Mormon church for 30-some years, came out, got saved, and she has a very loving spirit. She's the grandma type, you know, writing to, you know, uh, it's, if you know somebody, you want to reach them, you know, softly and tenderly, that's a good book to reach them. If you want, if you get somebody who's just logical, rational thinker, the uh, Tanner's book, and there's the phone number there, is an awesome book to reach Mormons. Another one I just read recently, the one on the right here, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right. This guy took a tremendous approach. He compares all the different Mormon books. Did you know in one of their books it says, if you have more than one wife, you're damned. In another one of their books it says, if you don't have more than one wife, you're damned. <laughs> Looks like you got a problem, don't you? He just compares all the, and they claim all of them are scripture. So he just lays it out, compares them all, says, okay, which one are you going to believe, fellas? Is, do you get to read much of that yet? It's, it's really good. Uh, Secret History of the Mormon Church goes into the things they don't want you to believe. For instance, if you ever drop out of the Mormon Church, it's another Mormon's duty to kill you. And they go through some of the executions that have happened down through history of people who got out. If you want to scare somebody out of Mormonism, that'd be the book to use to scare them out of it. <laughs> if you want to just sweetly bring them out, use one of the other ones, okay? I don't know if I'd use that one or not. But those are great books. I was surprised to find out here, just li this last year, that some of the major Catholic theologians, now I don't say all Catholic theologians, okay? It's only a few of them that believe this. The average Catholic doesn't know this at all. But some of their major theologians teach, the Son of God became man so that we might become God. Now, where did the idea that man can become God, where did that idea come from? <coughs> Satan in the Garden of Eden, right? He told Eve, if you do what I say, you can become like God. That idea originated with him. Think of all the different religions of the world. Let's pick uh, some of those who believe you can be reincarnated. You come back, you know, have another karma, another try at it. And if you're good, you get to be a little higher. If you're bad, you're a little lower. So just keep being good, and you get to become God eventually. It's the same lie. A lady called me today uh, in the office, and she was wondering about, you know, the Catholic Church and all this stuff, and she's a Catholic. And she said, what do you think about the Catholic Church? I said, well, I would put all religions in the world, all of them, into two categories, the do and the done. Simple way to categorize them, okay? The do kind says, you must do something to please God and go to heaven. The done category says, it's already been done. It's not what I do, it's what's been done for me. You can also break them up and call them the faith and the works. The do and the done. Do you have to do something to make God accept you? You know, an awful lot of kids grow up in homes thinking they have to do something to please Dad. And if they don't catch the ball, or they don't hit the home run, or they don't make the basket, then dad's not pleased, or mom's not pleased. A lot of people grow up thinking God is only happy with them when they're good. That's not the case. God loves you all the time, even when you're bad. And just like parents who really love their kids, you can love the child but hate what they did. So you punish the sin but still love the sinner. And that's the object, okay? Uh, punishing for you for what you did, but I love you. If I didn't love you, I'd just let you do it. So the idea that man can become God came from Lucifer in the Garden of Eden. In Isaiah chapter 14, it gives us some of the history of Lucifer and his fall. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? This one's going to be for three, for five craisins. Are you ready? What does the word Lucifer mean? 
Ooh, you've had enough, son. Let's get, I'll give you one. You get four now instead of five. We just, <laughs> we just dropped one. There you go, brother. The enlightened one. There you go. You can divvy them out to all the kids. Look at that. Lucifer, the enlightened one. Now look carefully at this verse. How art, thou fall, how, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Some of the newer versions of the Bible call Lucifer the morning star. Jesus Christ is the morning star. You've got to watch. you know which one it is, Mike, that has NIV? I believe you're right. Has Lucifer as the morning star. Ooh, you know what verse that is off the top of your head? We can look it up and find it. Yeah. Uh, check avpublications.com. You'll be surprised at some of the changes uh, in some of these other versions. Now, let me say this, okay? I stick strongly with the King James Version. But many people in the, you know, um, KJV camp are so intolerant of the other versions, and I think there are some really bad things, okay, in the other versions. But you need to give people some growing space, okay? You don't spank a two-year-old for wetting his pants. When he's 15, you might spank him for wetting his pants, but you don't do it when he's two. You have to allow him some growth time. And I think if a young, young Christian is reading the NIV or some other version, fine. Give him some growth room, okay? I remember I'd been saved for six months, and I was coming to church regular, bringing my RSV, Revised Standard Version, that I got from the Methodist Church. And I was underlining passages and thinking, wow, I was reading my Bible an hour a day. And I was growing in the Lord. And my preacher said, Kent, you ought to get a Bible. <laughs> I was hurt. I got a Bible. What do you mean I ought to get a Bible? <laughs> he said, no, you ought to get a real Bible. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, this one's got a lot of problems with it. Look at this. And he showed me some verses. I said, wow, you're right. Was Jesus born of a virgin or was he born of a young woman? Well, there's, there's a difference. Mine had him born of a young woman. You know, the Bible has him born of a virgin. That's a big difference. And so I got, I got rid of that, and I still have it at home. That's on the shelf. But I, I'd rather have somebody read the Revised Standard Version than Playboy. I mean, it depends what you want to compare it with, right? So don't go off on a tangent, blasting everybody, all the other versions. Give people some growth room. Especially in our type ministry out on creation. I, I kick, it, kick the dog as I walk by, but I don't spend hours on it. As soon as you do, you're going to narrow your audience way down. And it's not time to do that yet. I do cover the different versions on video number seven. By the time they've been through my whole seminar, 14 hours before I even get to the KJV issue, now they're ready to listen. That's why I put it last, well, near last in the seminar. Anyway, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Oh, John, running the camera there, we can go off on this for a long time, couldn't we? It's Lucifer that's weakening the nations. I'll tell you what, we just produced a videotape, if you want to call our ministry and get it, on the straw man. How many saw the movie Wizard of Oz? That Wizard of Oz movie was made to teach what Satan is doing in the world. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the money. Originally, in the book, it was silver slippers. Follow the silver and the gold trail. They changed it to ruby slippers so folks wouldn't catch on, you know, what's really going on in this movie. The straw man. No brain. The tin man. First words out of the tin man's mouth. He's standing there, stuck. What's he saying? Oil, oil, right? Tin man represents commerce, the financial, the, the business world. Has no heart. And it's ruthless. The business world is ruthless. And they run on oil. <laughs> the whole thing is a, a fiction. And John's done a great job on stuff on that. He's running the camera there if you want to see him later or get our videotape on straw man. But, uh, it is Satan that is weakening the nations. When Dorothy gets to the Emerald City, there's this huge Oz. Nobody gets to see the great Oz. Remember, and they finally get in to see him and his big, huge face and smoke and flame shooting up and the, everybody goes running out and the lion crashes through the window, you know, and they're scared stiff. At the end of the story, they find out who this Oz really is. 
It's a little bitty man behind a curtain pulling a bunch of levers, isn't it? He's nothing. It's all smoke and mirrors. And Lucifer looks huge to the average person. Wow, you can't fight against the devil. Look how big he is. Look, we're going to be shocked when we realize he's the one that weakens the nations. When we realize, people are going to say, verse John, people are going to say, is this the man that did the next verse? Is this, people are going to look narrowly upon him and say, is this the man that did this? When we watch Lucifer get cast into hell, we're going to say, you're kidding. That's it? <laughs> That's all it was all along? <laughs> Little bitty man pulling a bunch of levers. And the movie Wizard of Oz, certainly not a Christian movie at all, but they're just giving notice, hey folks, here's how we're going to do it. There's two worlds. There's the world of reality in Kansas, and then we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. <laughs> There's the fictional world. And that's another, that takes hours and hours to go through. We'll let John take care of those questions for me. But uh, verse, 16. verse 16, we shall, they shall look narrowly upon him and say, is this the man that just weakens them, that, you know, that did this? But he's going to be cut down to the ground. Next verse says, this is Lucifer speaking now. For thou hast said in thine heart, ready? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Every step he's putting himself a little higher. There's a whole sermon here on the five different steps. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and then I will be like the Most High. The five I wills of Lucifer, and again, there's whole sermons been been preached on this topic. <laughs> okay. There, we'll get it to stay up there. Yeah. Um, the five I wills of Satan. The last one, though, he said, I will be like the Most High. He's wanting to be like God, isn't he? Now, of course, he can't be like God, so he's mad at God. And at this point, I try to throw a little more humor into my seminar. You know, uh, he wants to be like God. He wants to be God, actually, but the job is not available. So he's mad at God. But he can't do anything to God, so he's mad at us because we're made in God's image. The reason Satan hates you and hates me is because we remind him of God. A good illustration here is a coin. I don't have any coins. Man, <laughs> that woman's expensive. Uh, but if you look at a coin, they stamp an image on there, don't they? After you carry it around in your pocket for a few years, the image gets worn, doesn't it? We were made in the image of God. We still retain some of that image, but we're pretty worn out, folks, okay? We're not too close anymore. Oh, a big one, son. Thank you so much. <laughs> a quarter. Uh, the image gradually gets worn and faded. And even in the drunks and the derelicts and the drug addicts and the prostitutes, there's, there's still an image of God there, folks. It's pretty worn and faded, but it's, it's, it's still recognizable. Made in the image of God. And God can restore it. That's the miracle of the new birth. I was going to apply that to your bill, son, but I'll just I'll let you have it back. <laughs> so God created man in his own image. We're made in the image of God. Lucifer wanted to be God and couldn't have the job. He was apparently kicked out of heaven sometime in the first hundred years after the creation. And so he decided he's going to devote his life to trying to destroy humanity. There are probably a lot of reasons behind this. Um, it could be because uh, he just wants to rebel against God, wants revenge. It could be because he uh, knows that some seed of the woman is going to bruise his head someday. So he wants to kill all the humans. There's probably a lot of reasons behind why uh, Satan decided to rebel, but he's been in rebellion for the last 6,000 years against God. In my seminar, I use hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of quotes and references. I try to footnote everything. This is one I currently don't have a footnote for. And there's always some atheist will say, Where's the foot, where, where did Hitler say that at? And I don't know. Uh, but the quote has been attributed to Hitler for a long time, and if somebody finds the actual reference where Hitler made speeches prolifically, I mean, to re just to read all of his speeches would take you the rest of your life. 
but Hitler is attributed, it is attributed to Hitler that he said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. Whether, I, I can't prove that he said that, okay, but the concept is right. You tell somebody something over and over and over again, they're going to believe it. If a kid grows up in a head-hunting society, and from the time he's two years old, he's taught, now Johnny, if you go to battle and you kill your enemy, that proves you are superior to him, or else he'd have killed you. But the way you can get his spirit is to cut his head off, break it open, and eat his brains. Well, of course, that's stupid, but suppose you're taught that all of your life. What are you going to do when you go to battle and kill somebody? <laughs> you're going to cut his head off, break it open, and eat his brains, aren't you? What you believe determines how you're going to behave. And if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. That's just a simple fact. Hitler is also attributed as saying, people are more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. And again, I'm going off on a lot of rabbit trails here, folks who have, who have made gigantic claims. One guy during the Civil War got tired of being a soldier, so he walked into the camp where they're, you know, doing surgery on the guys with their legs shot off and stuff, and just got one of the doctor's coats, put it on, and pretended to be a doctor for the rest of the war. He performed hundreds and hundreds of surgeries. Never had a day's medical training in his life. <laughs> he bluffed them all. I guess apparently he got to be a pretty good doctor after a while. <laughs> you practice on enough of them, you know, you learn a few things. <laughs> But uh, then I go into a little more family history. I have three, three, uh, two brothers and a sister. Uh, and I say, these are my, my two older brothers, Ross and Mark. They've always been older than I am. And people can always equate to this. Now, my reason for throwing in family picture and I'm the third son, okay? Where do you fit, Mike? You? You're the youngest of how many? Of two. Oh, well. <laughs> Eric, you're the second out of three, right? You're in the middle. Everybody comes from a family, right? Anything to do with a family will draw people in and say, oh, he's, you know, he's a real person. I have two older brothers, Ross, and this really happened, okay? I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois. Now, if I'm speaking in a southern state, I will say at that time normally, are there any other Yankees in the crowd? Are there any Yankees here tonight? Four or five, okay. How many southerners do we have? Ooh, a whole bunch. Okay, well, just remember who won, if you would. <laughs> A little bit of humor, <laughs> keeps people livened up again, okay? Uh, but I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois. When I was six years old, I came running into the breakfast table one morning, and I was the first one there for breakfast. And I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. My mom's custom was, you know, always lay out fruit for breakfast, you know. We'd always try to eat some kind of fruit. She tried to push fruit, tried, tried to make us healthy. We didn't always eat healthy, but she tried. And <laughs> did a pretty good job. But uh, we had, custom was to slice up banana and put it on your cereal. And so I got the last banana that morning. There were no more. A few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. They said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? And I said, yep, and I got it. And then I'll say, how many of you have an older brother or sister? How many of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling you get when you finally pull one over on them? They pick on you all the time. Boy, that morning I had them and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg little brothers for anything. They either beat him up and take it away, or they lie to him and try to trick him out of it somehow. How many of you ever got beat up by your older brother or sister because they wanted what you had? <laughs> He's got his hand up right there. Here's his brother sitting next to him, right? <laughs> of course. Everybody raised in a family can, can, can equate with that, right? And so my brother said, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. I was only six years old. It's been proven in laboratory tests. The brain doesn't even start to grow until kids are 18 to 20. <laughs> How many parents can verify that one from raising kids? Right? <laughs> and again, any parent <laughs> would say, yeah, you're right. Kids do the dumbest things, you know, and they fight over the dumbest things. <laughs> Your time is coming, son. Trust me. <laughs> you think, How can fighting over what? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Wake up. So my brother said to me, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. And they said, down in South America, they have these spiders that live up in the trees, and when they die, all their legs fold up, and mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs. And a banana is really made from moldy spider legs. 
And I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. And they said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle, you can still see the black spots where his legs were. <laughs> you know, I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. <laughs> and everybody in the room can, can uh, identify with having somebody tell them a lie and make a fool out of them when they were little. How many of you can identify if somebody did that, something similar to you, right? So again, you're drawing them into your world, getting them, and again, humor is a great anesthetic under which you do surgery. You get them laughing and then you preach against their sin. Ha, 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 <laughs> Surgery time. <laughs> We're going to remove that, okay? All right, our time is up. We'll take up next week. It looks like at the rate we're going, to cover my 15-hour seminar will take about seven years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you did not get a crazy and would like one, we'll let you have one. To ne next Thursday night, when we meet, I will go over some of the previous things we covered tonight, and we'll add more to it. And probably first thing we'll do, or one of the first things we'll do next Thursday is have a quiz over the sum of the things. And I, if I didn't say it's going to be a quiz question, it won't be a quiz question. And what I often do, even when I did my final exams, a couple of days before the final exam, I would pass it out and go over the material. You couldn't have a pencil or pen that day. We're going to go over it. Just read it over. Any questions you don't recognize? No. A lot of material on there. Yeah. You know it all. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Pass them back in. A couple days later, here's the test. No surprises. Here's the test. That's my idea. I, don't, I would rather have people come and say, wow, I'm excited about learning. I'm not trying to trick anybody. We're trying to teach you something. And that's the goal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for telling us how you did it and for leaving us a book that we can trust. Father, I pray for these folks here tonight. I pray that you'll speak to hearts. I pray that you'll draw them closer to you and strengthen their faith in your word. And Lord, I pray that you'll uh, help this course to be a blessing to many, to draw people closer to you. And if they're not saved, to get them saved. Thank you, Father, for dying on the cross to save us, for making salvation so free, so simple, so wonderful. And thank you, Father, that you see the future and the past and the present right now, and you love us anyway, and you still want to guide us. Lord, please help us to stay in close contact with you so you can do that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's continue. Last week we left off with uh, the reason Satan hates us. God, we're made in God's image. Now, we can spend days and days on this topic. It's a moral image. Uh, it's also, we, we have a trinity. We have a body, soul, and spirit. God is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can, there's whole books, you can take whole courses on that, so I'm going to refrain from getting distracted too far. We'll never get done. But to Hitler is quoted as saying, uh, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He also said that people are more likely to, to believe a big lie than a small one. And it's surprisingly true. If I told you, you know, I worked a job and I made, uh, you know, $40,000, people people, wow, oh, you really? But if I say I worked a job and made $1,000, nah, you did not. <laughs> They'll believe it if it's a bigger lie somehow. You know, just people are that way. I've got uh, two older brothers and a younger sister. I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois. When I was about six years old, I came running into the breakfast table one morning, and I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. And a few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. <clears throat> they said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. Any of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling when you finally pull one over on them? Boy, they pick on you all the time. That morning, I had them, and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg their little brother for anything. <clears throat> they just beat him up and take it away. <laughs> so my brother said, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. They said, well, down in South America, they have these spiders that live up in the trees, and all their legs fold up when they die, and mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs, and a banana is actually made from moldy spider legs. 
And I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. They said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle, you can still see the black spots where his legs were. I gave him my banana that morning, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't about to eat that thing. And uh, I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. If you want somebody to believe a lie, you have to mix it in with some truth. And that's what Satan has always done. When he quoted scripture to Jesus, he always quoted partial scriptures. If you read Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is up on the mountain, you know, being tempted of the devil, Satan's technique was always, and all the cults do the same thing. They quote part of a scripture. They mix a little bit of truth in with their lie, and it's just a technique that it works. I mean, that's what they've been using for years for rat poison. Same idea. You mix two things together. Rat poison is 99.995% good food. There is very little poison in rat poison. If I gave you a glass of water with two drops of arsenic in it, would you drink it? Well, it's mostly good water, but it's, it's the poison that's going to get you, right? Now, I'm afraid that television is about the same way. There might be a lot of good stuff on there, but there's little bits of poison in there once in a while that'll, that'll it'll get to you. It'll absolutely destroy you if you're not careful. They always seem to have, you know, kid, people say, oh, it's a good show, it's only got a few bad words. Well, think about it now. It's a good show, it's only got a few bad scenes. This is the same idea, to slowly get into your mind. Uh, they do this to sell Marlboro cigarettes. I share with my seminar, you know, how that they mix Marlboro cigarettes in with cowboys, as if there's some kind of connection. Now, you have to learn to, to, to watch for this, because this is a brainwashing technique. To sort Somebody associates smoking with being a macho cowboy. They've seen them together all the time, and now they make, they make the association psychologically. Well, they must, man, if I start smoking Marlboro, I'll be a cowboy. <laughs> That's simply not true, of course. They do the same thing with beer. They you know, always associate beer with sports. I tell people, stop and think about that. What is the connection between beer and sports? Do you want your quarterback full of beer when he's out there calling the plays? Do you want those guys in Indianapolis 500? You know, do you want them going 200 miles an hour, tanked up on beer? Watch the world heavyweight champion boxing. They're out there slugging it out. What's right on the mat under their feet? <laughs> Budweiser. I tell them it's not Budweiser, it's Bud Stupid. Or Bud Dumber. You know, <laughs> they call it Budweiser, but it doesn't make them any wiser, that's for sure. The Bible is real clear about the subject. Uh, don't touch alcohol. Now, who hath woe? They that tarry long at the wine. Let me just kick this dog as we walk by. In the English language, uh, we have some words that are kind of limited. For instance, we have one word, love, which has many different meanings. I love pizza. I love my wife. I love my dog. Those are different kinds of love. And we, we know automatically what you mean by the sentence it's used in. We know which kind of love you're talking about. In the Greek language, they were kind of limited in, in some other areas. Uh, they have many different words for love, but they only have one word for wine where we would have several words. We would have grape juice, grape jelly, grape syrup, alcoholic wine. So there are many different words that we have in English that they did not have in the Greek. They had one word. If it comes from the grape, it's called wine. It does not mean it is fermented, which is why the Bible says in Proverbs 23, they that talking about they that tarry long at the wine, and then you see in Proverbs 23, 31, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. Now think about it. That means there is a time when it isn't red. It's still called wine, but once it ferments, if you read this passage carefully, when it's red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, when it begins to stir itself as it ferments. So some people say Jesus drank wine. No, he didn't. Not our kind of wine. He made, turned the water into wine, which was grape juice, and they drank it the same day. And Jesus could not have drank alcoholic wine because he would have gone against what the scripture says. And he didn't violate any scriptures. So the whole problem comes from the limited Greek language in that particular word, and English has more words to describe that. Anytime you translate, you have that problem. Uh, Tanya, you speak Russian, you know, you try to, sometimes there just isn't a good word to, to put in, you know, for what do you mean by that? And sometimes, sometimes it takes a whole sentence to describe what one word says. And this is a case with wine. The Bible's real clear in Habakkuk chapter 2, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. There's a curse on those that supply alcohol to other people. There's a curse on those that drive the beer truck. There's a curse on those that give out the wine. 
I just, there's a curse on them. I don't want to curse on my life. I, I couldn't take a job as a stewardess on an airplane for fear God would be upset with me because I'd have to serve the first class passengers alcohol when they ask for it. I, I, I couldn't work in a store if I had to serve alcohol. I, I wouldn't want to be a waitress or a waiter if I had to do that. I know some people that have stood their grounds and said, this is my conviction. I'll come work at your store. I'll be a good waiter, et cetera, et cetera, but I won't touch the alcohol. And look, if you're a good worker, the boss will give you something else to do. But that's just Habakkuk's a good verse to consider. There is a curse on those that uh, drink alcoholic beverages and those that even serve it to other people. Now, I tell people, you know, so one kid said, don't you, what's the matter, Brother Hovind, don't you like beer? I said, I don't know. I've never tasted it. I'm 47, never had a drop in my life. I've had NyQuil a few times. But, and then he said, well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? And I always respond by saying, well, that's a brilliant way to live. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever laid your head under a semi-truck? Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? <laughs> you don't have to try everything to know if it's good or bad, okay? There are other ways to learn. And any kid dumb enough to fall for that thing, well, you've got to try it to know if you'll like it. Look, that's not, you know, have you ever jumped off the building into the he concrete head first? You ever poke your eye with an ice pick? I mean, <laughs> no. You don't have to do things to know if it's good or bad. You can figure it out some other ways, you know. One good way is to read what God's Word says. Another good way is to talk to somebody who's older. You know, you get these seventh graders taking advice from fellow seventh graders. <laughs> that's real brilliant. Man, ask somebody who's been around the block a few times. They can give you some wisdom. I like sitting and talking to the old people, you know, these 70, 80, 90-year-olds. <laughs> Unbelievable some of the stuff they come up with. Just, they've been around, you know. They've learned a few things. Um, what's happening, though, the, the idea of mixing good and bad together is exactly what's happening in our textbooks. Science textbooks, and I have a huge collection of them, there's a lot of good science in them, okay? But there's some poison mixed with it. If you analyzed rat food, you would find out it's mostly good food. And I'm not objecting to good food. It's the poison that's bad. And I'm not objecting to science, but it's the poison mixed in with the science. And this is how they get by with it. They will say, oh, the book's awfully good. Yeah, but what about the poison in there? Let me show you something. Here's a first grade textbook. They tell the kids in first grade, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. They start off with a first grader telling him the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Now, this is the teacher's edition. So what I'm showing is what's in the margin for the, for the teacher to teach the kids. Teach the kids the earth is four and a half billion years old. Now, if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. Don't you think it's reasonable that the first grader should be able to go to school, listen to the teacher, and believe what they say? I mean, they ought to be able to, shouldn't they? So the humanists know in order to get their religion believed by the majority, they have to start with the kids when they're really young. Start in first grade. They tell them again in second grade. Since its formation, four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. At the bottom they say, life too has evolved on Earth. Now right here we've got to take some time, and one of the quiz questions next week will be the six different meanings of the word evolution. This is how the kids get confused every time. I have learned the hard way, after doing, what, 46 debates now and over 4,000 radio and TV call-in talk shows, if you want to win a debate on evolution, it's very simple. You first define the word. When somebody says, do you believe in evolution, you have to say, what do you mean? Because there are six different meanings to the word. Number one, we have cosmic evolution, which is more commonly known as the Big Bang. Has anybody ever observed a Big Bang produce anything orderly? If best I remember, Big Bangs produce big messes. Ask the folks in Hiroshima that survived that Big Bang about 60 years ago, right? Ask the folks in uh, Iraq that survived all the Big Bangs we sent over there, you know, <laughs> several years ago. Cosmic evolution would be the origin of time, space, and matter. Remember we mentioned how God is a trinity from Genesis 1.1. Uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth is a reference to time, space, and matter right there in Genesis 1.1. The Big Bang is an alternative substitute way to explain how we got time, space, and matter. The Bible starts off and says, in the beginning, God. Now, if you can believe those first four words, the rest of the Bible is easy to believe. God created time, space, and matter according to the evolution. The Big Bang created time, space, and matter. They attribute 
the same characteristics that God has to Big Bang. Able to produce time, space, and matter. The second definition of the word, after the Big Bang uh, supposedly exploded, the Big Bang, according to the evolutionists, would produce hydrogen and possibly a little bit of helium. The sun is hydrogen and helium. The question then would come, how do we get the other elements? Where do we get lithium and carbon and oxygen and you know neon and all these 92 elements plus the synthetic ones we have? Where do we get these elements? You'd have to have really billions of years of chemical evolution. Now, the answer the evolutionists often give to this one is, well, stars are so hot, they're able to produce higher elements from just the heat. <laughs> okay, well, where did the energy come from then? You're going to have to have either matter or energy, one or the other. I mean, yes, stars do produce a lot of heat and sometimes produce other elements, some of the higher elements. But all of the um, reactions we see in nature, we see uranium decay to lead. Potassium decays to argon. They're all downward. We don't see any upward ones without enormous energy input. So the question is, how did we get the higher elements? They don't talk about this hardly at all, but it is a real serious obstacle. You'd have to go through a stage of chemical evolution. Then after that, you'd have to have stellar, which means stars, stellar and planetary evolution. How did the stars form? I mean, you walk outside, you take a look, there's a lot of stars up there. Estimates are every person on Earth could have two trillion of them <laughs> per person. So where did they come from? One atheist was trying to answer this question one time, and he said, well, don't you know, Dr. Oven, if, if 20 stars explode near each other, they'll produce enough energy to create a star. <laughs> I said, well, think about it. You've got to lose 20 to gain one? You sound like a Democrat trying to borrow your way out of debt. You know? <laughs> If you're losing 20 to gain one, it looks like a losing proposition to me, doesn't it? First place, nobody's ever seen that happen. It's just theoretical that it could happen if 20 exploded. That's just all theoretical. Nobody's ever observed it. Now, since science deals with what we can observe, we can test, we can demonstrate, this part of evolution is not science. It's part of their religion. It would have to happen, though. It'd have to happen a whole bunch of times. I mean trillions of times because there's a lot of stars up there. Number four, you'd have to have organic evolution. That is basically the origin of life. How did life get started from non-living material? We will cover a whole lot more on that experiments they've tried to do to create life in the laboratory. Back when we get to uh, my, what's on my video number four, it'll probably be several years before we get there at the rate we're going in this course, but uh, we cover the origin of life. It's absolutely hasn't happened, nowhere close. One, one student, I was in a debate one time at University of West Florida, and this smart aleck student stood up and he said, Now, Dr. Hoven, uh, what would you say if a bunch of intelligent scientists someday create life in the laboratory? I said, Well, first place, they're absolutely no place, nowhere close to it. They can't even get the amino acids to stick together very good, and that's just a small building block. I said, Secondly, I would have to say, if a bunch of intelligent scientists produce life in the laboratory, that would prove it takes intelligence to create life which is what I've been saying all along. <laughs> it would actually prove creation, wouldn't it? It certainly wouldn't prove evolution. It wouldn't prove it could happen by itself, by chance, over billions of years. And it hasn't been done. They're absolutely nowhere close. Step number five, you would have to have macroevolution. This is the origin of major kinds. There are quite a few different kinds of animals. Where did they come from? When you get into a discussion on evolution, I would encourage you to avoid using the word species. The Bible says the animals will bring forth after their kind. Now just stick with what the Bible says and you'll be fine. Because if you get into a discussion on species, somebody's going to prove to you that a dog and a wolf are different species. And the, Well, by our classification system, they are. There's Canis lupus and Canis domesticus, and they're different species. I point out, well, they're infertile. A dog and a wolf can breed and produce puppies. So there really is no good solid definition of species. I would say there probably also is not a good solid definition of the word kind. But if you put a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana on the table and bring in a three-year-old and say, which one is not like the others? He could probably tell you, it's the banana, right? 
A horse and a zebra are the same kind of animal. It's obviously not like a tomato, right? I'm not sure exactly where the border is between the different kinds. There probably is a little room, for that, and that'd be a good area of study. That's an area worthy of study. But it's pretty obvious when there are different kinds of animals. Most of the cases are clear-cut obvious. Some are a little questionable. Okay, we can study the fringe if you'd like, but let's not waste time focusing on the fringe. Let's look at the bigger picture. The sixth and final definition of evolution is microevolution. That is variations within the kind. Now, this one is scientific. This happens all the time. That's what farmers do for a living, isn't it? They try to produce a particular breed that's good for their particular area. You know, if they happen to live in cold climates, they try to get a cow that can survive the cold climate. Down in Texas, where it's hot, they produce the, the Brahma bull, you know, what can stand the heat. And then you get the Angus that has real good beef. And so when you're in a right kind of temperature area, you combine the two and get a Brangus, which has both heat resistance and good beef. Farmers spend a fortune trying to develop a variety that's good for their area, even varieties of cotton for certain kinds of soil. But see, variation within the kind, I, I actually object to the word microevolution because that's what confuses the kids. But they're using it anyway, so we, we're kind of stuck with their term, okay? See, when they define the terms, it makes the ar argument a little tougher. The first five are religious. They have never been observed. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas a couple weeks ago, and first thing I did, I gave the six different meanings of the word evolution. I said, now folks, number six is scientific. I wouldn't argue about that. Bacteria become resistant to drugs after a while. I won't argue about that. It's still a bacteria. Roaches become resistant to pesticides. It's still a roach. And there's a limit to the variation. They probably never will become resistant to a sledgehammer. Okay, there is, There's a limit in there someplace, right? So what's going to happen, scientists or evolution teachers are going to give thousands of examples of microevolution, which is indeed true. And then they somehow, by association, make the kids believe that all six of those go together. And it, it's, it's, it, it ought to be illegal to do that, okay? It's called bait and switch. You get them to, you know, offer them one definition of evolution, you know, variation within the kind. Most of the textbooks will say something like, uh, evolution is change in a species over time. And that sounds real innocent, and that's true. Aren't you probably, don't you probably look different than your grandpa? Yeah. Does that prove you came from a rock? Uh, no. <laughs> you see what I mean? Certainly doesn't prove the Big Bang or any other thing else up there. That's all fairy tale stuff. And if you will learn those six different meanings of the word evolution, and whenever you get into a debate or an argument on the subject, just simply stop and say, what do you mean by evolution? And if they say, well, things change. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. I believe that. Oh, you believe in evolution? Well, I believe things change. I believe the change is limited to whatever information is already in the gene code. That doesn't prove a turtle and a banana are related, that's for sure. It might be that all the 500 varieties of turtles came from maybe only 10 turtles in the Garden of Eden. I don't know how many kinds God made, and today there's probably a lot of new varieties, but still, there's still a turtle. So be very careful. You can win the argument every time, if you all, and you've got to watch for it, because they will constantly try to blur the border between micro and macro, and they're missing the entire point of the other phases of evolution. Those are the six meanings, and if you just keep, you keep hammering on that, Eventually, they'll either get mad and go away, or they will get, they will get converted. Because those that's to me, is the whole crux of the argument. The teachers are taught, in the teacher's manuals, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. If I told you a dog came from a rock because somebody gave it a pill, and that's stupid, right? But in the science textbook, they teach the dog came from the rock over billions of years. So if it happens slowly, you know, maybe, it's, maybe that happened. <laughs> it's, it's still a fairy tale, okay? It doesn't happen. Time's not going to change it. You know, you say the, the, the man flew through the air, you know, like on the, uh, some kind of fairy tale. 
Well, it's obviously a fairy tale if the guy goes flying through the air. But what if he goes slowly walking through the air? Is that still is that less of a fairy tale? The whole thing that happens with evolution is they try to hide behind billions of years ago, as if that'll make a difference. And it doesn't make any difference. Okay, the first law of thermodynamics. The word thermo, where we get our word thermometer, means heat. We will ask you to define thermodynamics. Dynamics is where we get our word for dynamite, which means power. So thermodynamics is heat power. One of the universal laws, the first universal law here, thermodynamics, tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. If you change something from one state to another, you burn the tree, you change it into ash and energy. In the process, something is lost that can never be regained. When you burn the gasoline in your car, your car engine, if it's really tuned up well, is probably about 30% efficient. Most of the exploding gasoline, the energy in there is wasted as heat. That's why you have to have a radiator to keep the engine cooled down. If you could get an engine 100% efficient, it, it'd get 500 miles to the gallon. But so much is wasted as heat. Your body right now, we're in a room that's about 70 degrees and your body's 98 degrees. All that extra heat is heating the room, which eventually will go out and heat the yard, which eventually heats up the world and <laughs> dissipates. And it's lost, and cannot be regained. So the first law of thermodynamics says matter cannot be created or destroyed, which raises the obvious question, what started it all? It had to start someplace. Let's take about a two-minute break, stand up, turn around, stretch. So the word thermodynamics simply means heat power. There are three different laws of thermodynamics. We'll get into the first and second one. The third one, I don't remember what it was. Nobody ever uses it anyway. But uh, it's one of those things you learn in physics class and then you forget. But uh, if matter cannot be created or destroyed, and sometimes this, this is phrased a little different, but this is the same concept. Basically, it says it can only be changed from one form to another. You can change matter to energy. I can burn a piece of wood and turn it into heat. It's very difficult to change the energy back to matter, though it can be done. Uh, but there's such a loss. Every time there's a loss of irretrievable energy that eventually everything will experience what is called a heat death. The universe will all cool down. It will be uniformly cold everywhere. Um, now, since matter cannot be created or destroyed, this leaves us two choices to explain how the world got here. We are here. So there are only two choices of how we got here. Number one, somebody made this world. And this is where you get into, okay, which, who made it? Well, there's all sorts of options there. You know, is it Allah or Jehovah or God or Buddha or whatever, you know. That's where you get into all the different religions of which one is right. Uh, but the fact is, it basically breaks down into two categories. Somebody made it or it made itself. Now, if you want to say it made itself, well, then you're in the category of there is no God, the atheistic category. If you're, an, if you're a theist, a person who believes there is a God, then you would have to then start to figure out, okay, which God? And what's he like? And why did he do it? You know, those kind of questions. There are some people who would create a third category. They would say, oh, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. <laughs> oh, I think you can forget about those folks, okay? We are here. So either somebody made it like the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth, or it made itself like the humanists say. The Humanist Manifesto, uh, 1933, first plank was, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Now the Humanist Manifesto was rewritten and revised in 1973. That's the Humanist Manifesto 2. That might be a good question. Humanist Manifesto, 1933. One of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto was a guy named John Dewey. John Dewey went to, I believe, Vermont and became the leader of the Teachers College. Under his direction, they produced many humanist leaders who went off and became leaders of major colleges and universities around the world which then turned out thousands and thousands of humanist-believing teachers, which then went out and took over the school system. Education was infiltrated to a, a large part of the blame can go on 
John Dewey, who was one of the signers of Humanist Manifesto, 1933. So we'll get into education more, but John Dewey um, and his philosophy of humanism, see, really goes, boils down to this. If there is no God, then we better get together and figure out how to run this world, because it's up to us, right? So we end up with man's wisdom. Twice in the Bible, it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, if there is no God, then how do you decide right from wrong? I often ask people, you know, if, if they believe in evolution, I say, well, how do, you t how do you tell right from wrong? Think about it. What is sin, if evolution is true? <laughs> There's no way to tell, is there? You don't have a standard, nothing to measure it against. But the humanist believe the universe is self-existing and not created. Well, this, of course, is rather difficult to believe, and the devil knew it would be hard to believe. So he had to think up some way to sound scientific that the world could make itself. And over the years, many theories have been proposed to explain how the world can make itself. There's been the nebular hypothesis, was real popular for a long time. The current one today is called the Big Bang Theory. How many have heard of the Big Bang Theory? That is the current uh, way to explain how the universe got here without a creator, which of course really doesn't explain a thing, because they're just giving to some mythical uh, name, Big Bang, they're giving it the same characters that God has. Big Bang created time, space, and matter. The Bible says God created time, space, and matter. So they're trying to accomplish the same thing, explain why we're here, and what, you know, who are we, why are we here, where are we going when we die, and those kind of things, without God. So the Big Bang has to, would be their idea of the beginning. Here's a typical textbook uh, used in Escambia County right here in Pensacola, Florida. It was. I don't know if it still is. In fact, it's a 92 edition. How was the universe born and how will it end? Now, look at that first question. Isn't that going back to the four basic questions of life? Who are we? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going when it ends, when it's all over, when we die? Every religion tries to answer that. So what they're doing here is introducing a religious concept in the schools to explain something that every human wants to know, some of the basic questions of life. Most astronomers believe. Now look at that sentence. What does that say to the average freshman kid in high school? Well, most astronomers believe this, therefore it must be true. You see how it becomes truth by majority opinion. Dangerous thing to do. Okay. In the first place, how do you prove most astronomers believe that? They don't offer any evidence for how they prove that. They just make the statement. I could say, everybody knows Fords are better than Chevys. Which is, first place, probably not true. But uh, if just because I make the statement and sound dogmatic when I make it, that doesn't make it true, does it? That's a judgment call. And this is a judgment call, but think of the impression this makes on a freshman who's taken this course, or an eighth grader in this case, general science. Most astronomers believe, well, what's the kid going to think? He's 13 years old. Well, I better believe it too then. Isn't, isn't that what's going to happen? Most astronomers believe that about 18 to 20 billion years ago, I'd like to stop right there and point out, this date changes all over the scale. I've seen some say the Big Bang was 8 billion years ago. It ranges, I, you see every number between 8 and 20 billion published. The fact is, it's long ago and far away. That's what they're trying to get across. Now, one of the things I do that is extremely effective when you're trying to talk to an evolutionist or a person who just doesn't know what they believe, even if I'm on the airplane, riding on the airplane, and sitting next to somebody, we get into a discussion, you know, what do you do? You know, I'm evangelist, I speak on dinosaurs in the Bible. Of course, they want to know what? I get my napkin out or whatever, one of the you know, barf bags on the airplane or something, and I draw these two lines. I have learned that if you just simply say 18 to 20 billion years ago, the kid reads that, the brain cannot absorb big numbers. Congress knows that. It takes advantage of it all the time. So by showing it on a graph, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. Something clicks between what you're seeing now and what you're hearing and what you're thinking. It all seems to fit together. So by graphing it out, I'll, I'll, on my napkin I'll make two lines and I'll label one 6,000 years ago, creation, 4,400 years ago, flood, 
2,000 years ago, Jesus' life. Here we are today. By the way, I put the word today instead of a date because my chart would go out of date every year if I did that, right? <laughs> okay. Then I draw their graph. 20 billion years ago, Big Bang. And I ask, often ask him the question, what exploded and where did it come from? And the obvious question is, what was before that? But if you graph it out, all of a sudden they can see it's, it's, it's still it's dumb. But somehow the visual of being able to see what they believe on a timeline helps them to realize how dumb it is. Otherwise, they would just simply believe it because it's, 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 it's a mental gymnastic. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, which is what the textbooks teach. And 3 billion years ago, life evolved. Some say 3.8. It doesn't matter. The concept is still the same. Okay. And then this life had to, you have, then you have to have macro evolution to get to various life forms. All six meanings of the word evolution can be found on the chart. Cosmic evolution, that'd be the Big Bang. Sometime in here you'd have to have chemical evolution, the st chemicals would have to evolve. Then you'd have to have stellar evolution, the stars and planets have to evolve. They would teach the Earth was one of the last ones for planetary evolution at right here. Then you have to get uh, origin of life, organic evolution. Organic means living. And then you have to have macroevolution, changes between kinds. And finally, way at the end, you get a little bit of microevolution, variations within the kind. And from here on is all we've observed. All the rest of this is imagination. But by putting it on a graph, all of a sudden they start to see, wow, that is silly, isn't it? So the textbook tells, tells the kids, 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe. By the way, the word universe is a question we should ask about. Universe comes from two Latin words. Uni means single, a unicycle. Verse means a spoken sentence. You have verse and prose. So a universe, the word itself means a single spoken sentence. We live in a single spoken sentence. God said, let there be. See, God spoke everything into existence. Now, everything I've ever built took effort on my part, right? God spoke and created. I can't comprehend that for sure. That's called infinite power. You know, when God speaks, the waves lay down, the wind stops, the dead come to life. The rocks cry out. Everything in the universe obeys His voice, uh, except us. We're the only ones he's having a little trouble with right now, but <laughs> he will fix that someday too, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But for now, he's having a little, tr little trouble with us. But he just spoke. Now, that's a powerful thought, that we live in a universe. And I use it on the evolutionists all the time. You know, we live in a universe, single spoken sentence. This textbook says, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region. Now, hold, stop right there. Where did the gravity come from to make it pull together? Very, t very dense. Where did the heat come from? I mean, that's energy. They don't offer any explanation for that. They just say, boys and girls, here's how it happened. Now, they get mad at us for saying, in the beginning, God. Where did God come from? Oh, okay, stop right there. Where did your matter come from? Where did your energy come from? Where did your gravity come from? They don't have any answers either, do they? It's just as much a religion as what we have. The point is, both are religious. The problem is, this religion is tax-supported. That's why I offer in my ministry a quarter of a million dollars for anybody with any real, hard, scientific evidence for evolution. I get lots of letters because of that offer on my website. Uh, even the billboard we put up in St. Louis, right next to the St. Louis uh, Museum, where they have the Temple to Darwin, basically is what it is. Um, people would say, oh, no, of course we can't prove evolution. Can you prove creation? Ha, ha, ha. But that's exactly what I want them to say. I respond by saying, no, no, I cannot prove creation, and you cannot prove evolution. So my question is, since neither of us can prove what we believe, why do I have to pay for your religion to be taught in the schools? Shuts them up every time. Because that's a religion, folks. You believe 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was in a very tiny dot, smaller than a period on a page? What would it take to put all the matter in the universe into a dot the size of a period? 
That'd take a lot of pressure, wouldn't it? This is fairy tale stuff. But somehow, remember, if you tell a big lie, people are more likely to believe it. When this Big Bang Theory first got started, they said all the matter in the universe was in a sphere, I think they said 70,000 light years across. About 10 or 15 years later, they said, no, it was only 10,000 light years across. It keeps getting smaller and smaller. Now it's down to a dot. Guess what's coming after the dot? Nothing at all. What they're telling the kids here is, we have an explanation for where we came from, where are we going when we die, who are we, the purpose of life. It's all right here, folks. They're offering the same thing. But now, it's godless. You're the result of an accident. There is no real purpose to life. Isn't that what this boils down to? We all got here by chance. Which basically means, hey, you might as well have fun, because there is nothing to life. You're nothing but stardust. This destroys kids' faith. Destroys everything about them. This textbook says, by the way, used in Escambia County, all the matter in the universe, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, after many billions of years, of course. This area may be no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another Big Bang will occur. The formation of a universe will begin all over again. A universe that periodically expands and then contracts back on itself is called a closed universe. In a closed universe, a Big Bang may occur once every 80 to 100 billion years. Talk about fairy tale stuff. <laughs> what they're trying to do here is avoid the obvious question, where did the Big Bang, where did the matter come from? Oh, well, it came from a previous Big Bang. You see how they're trying to do that? That's like some of the you know, Hindu religions. You know, where did God come from? Well, he came from a previous God. Oh, where did that one come from? <laughs> well, he came from one before that, you know. This is what the Mormon religion teaches. They teach, as I am, God once was. As God is, I shall be. It's one of their slogans. They teach God was a man like us. And if you're a good Mormon, you get to go be a god someday and start your own universe. So it avoids the ultimate question of how did it begin? Oh, it's just, it's just always been. It's always, it's always been. That's what they're trying to say here. 18 or 20 billion years ago, there's going to be you know, a big bang. It was a big bang. And then in another 80 billion years, it's going to close up and start over again. This textbook says nothing really means nothing. This guy's real smart, right? <laughs> he said not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. <laughs> now here we have 16.5 billion years ago. I told you the number ranges all over the scale from 8 to 20, right? Remember, it started off with a, a big, big dot, you know, 70,000 light years across. Now it's down to a dot. Now it's down to nothing. That's what I ask him. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Nothing exploded, and here we are. Huh? Oh, that, that, that sounds good. <laughs> well, if you tell a big lie, people are more likely to believe it. Do you understand how many millions of Americans believe that? Do you understand how many kids got taught that and believed it today in our school system within 10 miles of where I'm standing? <laughs> Think about it. Think about the ramifications of that. If a kid believes that, what's his image of himself? I'm nothing but dirt, nothing but chemicals. See, the Christian image, you're made in God's image. God loves you. He's got a purpose for you. You get a bunch of kids believing that, there's no telling what they're going to do. One of the two boys that shot everybody in Colorado, both of the boys were strong believers in evolution and followers of Charles Darwin's teachings. One of them had on his t-shirt, natural selection, when they found him dead in the hallway. That's where it leads, folks. Hey, there's no God. I had a kid sit in the second row in a public school I spoke at in Pennsylvania. He said, Mr. Hoven, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yep, there is no God. 
I said, are you sure? He said, oh yeah, I'm sure. I said, well tell me son, if you're an atheist, how do you determine right from wrong? He said, oh that's easy. I decide if something's right or wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, boy, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, you see, I'm the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that logic? Hey, if there is no God, the strongest survive, right? If I can take it away and I'm bigger than you, well, it's just your tough luck. Doesn't the lion do that with the zebra when he gets hungry? I'm taking your life away so I can eat. This type of thinking leads toward, le leads to the logical conclusion is there is no such thing as right and wrong, so might makes right. This kind of thinking leads to Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Paul Pot. We get into a lot more on that in video number five about the how communism and Marxism and Nazism all ties in with evolution. It all starts, you have to get rid of God, which then, if there is no God, who's the next most likely candidate to be the uh, king of the universe? Man. Humanism has to have evolution. That's why it's the humanist worldview. Deify mankind. Ye shall be as gods. Exactly what Lucifer said. And that's what's going on. That's how it ties together. This is Scientific American, which is a major science journal. I want you to look what this author said. The observable universe could have evolved, remember, six meanings to that word, okay, from an infinitesimal region, which means a dot. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. <laughs> they put this in a science book and call it science? I'd call it a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. That doesn't explain anything. Science is what we know, what we can observe, what we can test. You can't know or observe or test that. That's wild speculation. He's guessing, folks. He doesn't know a thing. Uh, <clears throat> According to the Big Bang Theory, there's several different, several different aspects to this. One of the Big Bang Theory says that a bunch of nothings all over exploded <coughs> and produced all the galaxies. So it happened all simultaneous. Oh, that, that explains it real good, you know. Another one says it was all in one dot and exploded and flew out in all directions. Another one, called the nebula hypothesis, says this cloud of dust all got together. Of course, obviously the question is, where did all this dust come from, right? But all this dirt in the universe got together in a little bitty tiny dot, and it kept getting drawn in tighter and tighter, and of course it began to spin. Now, the idea that the universe was spinning which is what the textbooks teach, it's spun faster. This is important because if you go out and look at the planets or the sun or the earth or the stars, everything seems to be spinning. So where did this spinning motion come from? Doesn't it take energy to make something turn around? They either have to have each planet and star and sun and moon start spinning on its own somehow, which is quite a stretch, you know. Why is everything spinning? Or they have to say the initial object was spinning, and that's where, that's why all the fragments are spinning. If there was a big bang, you know, this initial object was spinning <coughs> and exploded. They're faced with a pretty unpleasant choice. Neither one is logical, scientific, uh, certainly not scientifically provable. They say this nebula began to spun, it spun faster and faster, and finally it exploded <coughs> with a big bang. Of course, obvious questions are, where did the energy come from? Where did the matter come from? You know, who made this big bang anyway? And they don't try to answer, offer any answer to that. Here's my two timelines, and again, I found this is absolutely the most effective way to, to get the point across. The evolutionists believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. The Christian believes 6,000 years ago God created. We believe in the beginning God. They believe in the beginning dirt. They're in the same boat we are trying to answer how did it start. Now you have to watch. I do debates frequently, and I, I it's in a, where was I last week? Knoxville, Tennessee. No, Coleman, Alabama, the week before that. The article that came out in the paper, somebody faxed it to me. Oh, they blasted me up one side and down. They always wait till I'm gone, you know, <laughs> and then blast me when I get out there to defend myself. After I left El Paso, Texas, back in uh, October 99, the news article came out, and look at the title here. 
religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. Now think for a second. What is the unspoken message here? What they're trying to imply is evolution belongs with religion. In other words, those who believe the Bible are religious and everybody else is scientific. Evolution is combined with science is what they're trying to say. Just by the title, is it religious and scientific leaders debate evolution? Or is it uh, creation religion and evolution religion? See, they're both religions. But the news media always seems to always put the slant that, uh, you know, if you believe the Bible, you're not scientific. The unspoken mess there's a lot of unspoken messages here. The Bible isn't part of science. Religion isn't part of science. Isn't that what they're trying to say? There's a difference between religion and science? They do this all the time, and you've got to watch for it. Yes, sir? Many, sci many scientists do also happen to believe in evolution. I could say some scientists drive Fords, some scientists drive Chevys. It doesn't mean the Ford has anything to do with science or the Chevy has something to do with science. The fact that he believes in evolution and also is a scientist does not mean there's a connection. And you've got to be careful with that, okay? Everybody has a religious belief. I have religion, everybody has some kind of religious belief, okay? Even atheists. So, the fact that a scientist happens to believe in evolution doesn't mean what he believes in is scientific. He's just mixing his religion with his science. Also, you have to watch who gets to decide who is a scientist. The word science means knowledge. So a person who is in the pursuit or study of knowledge is a scientist. Also, if you look at what happened in the Soviet Union, you know, 10 years ago, if a teacher stood up in class and said, kids, <coughs> I don't believe in communism. Capitalism is a much better system. What would happen to that teacher? Gulag, all right? Siberia, huh? You like snow, huh? Yeah, we can fix that, right? If they survived. Then the teachers get up in school and say, all teachers believe in evolution. Or all teachers believe in communism or whatever. They try to use this. See, anybody who wants to use majority opinion as an argument, as some kind of evidence, red flags ought to go up all over the place. Hold on just a minute. Majority opinion doesn't mean a thing. You go to headhunting society, the majority believes it's okay to cut somebody's head off and eat them. Well, it doesn't mean it's right. And so what they do, they try to silence the opposition. Rather than using logic, they use intimidation. And if a scientist does not go along with what everybody else believes, he's likely to lose his job. A couple days ago, Dan and I sat in the living room of Robert Gentry in T Knoxville, Tennessee, who worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories. He's a scientist. He was one of the world's experts on the disposal of nuclear waste. But he, he wrote all sorts of articles. They were published in all sorts of major journals until they found out he's a creationist. Right away, shut him off. Nobody will publish anything he writes anymore. Because if they do, then they're giving credibility to a creationist. And they want to be able to stand up and say, you creationists never publish in scientific journals. Well, yeah, we try, but you won't take our stuff. So that's like somebody standing up in the Soviet Union saying, well, hey, you know, capitalists, uh, there aren't any capitalist teachers. Obviously, it can't be good. I mean, it doesn't take a freshman law student to figure that out. That's not good logic. But the technique uh, that the media uses all the time is to try to divide religion from science. We'll get into more when we get into seminar part four of how Charles Lyell did that in his book, Principles of Geology, back in, declared back in 1830. He's one of the guys, uh, there are many people in the early 1800s who tried to drive a wedge between the Bible and science. Truth of the matter is, all of the branches of science were started by creationists. 
from 1600s, 1700s, all the major branches of science. I defy people to name me one advancement we have in scientific information because of the evolution theory. Is that why we have light bulbs, computers, plastics, space shuttles? What, what good has the evolution theory done? Come up with some dur during the course. Or if you watch our video, send me some. I would like to know what good has the theory done? See, if a person believes there's a creator, then he's going to look for design and order in nature. Why did, the, why did the creator do it that way? Oh, I bet there's a reason for that. Let me think what it is. One guy named Murray was reading his Bible one day, and it says uh, in Psalm chapter 8, Whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. He said, I wonder if there are paths in the sea. You know, when they sailed from Europe over to America, they took the shortest route. Murray spent a lifetime studying currents in the ocean and discovered because of ocean currents, they could save an awful lot of time. Instead of taking the short route across the middle, follow the current. It's longer, but you get there faster. It's like having a tailwind the whole time. He got that from the Bible. The you know, Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. People read that and say, wow. Up until, you know, a lot of people used to take, they take their blood out to help them get well. Clear up until 1860, they did bloodletting. And the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. You can study the hit. There's a good book called uh, Men of Science, Men of God, published by uh, ICR. It carries it. I don't know if they publish it. But uh, you can get icr.org and get it from them. A great book, Men of Science, Men of God, showing a lot of the godly scientists of the past. You ever heard of an MRI machine? Magnetic resonance imaging. The guy who invented that is a creationist, loves God, believes the Bible. Is he a scientist? Oh, yeah. But see, to the average evolutionist, that guy would not qualify as a scientist because he believes in creation. So if they define the terms, who's a scientist, of course they will win the argument. And that's how they do it. That's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to define the terms. And you've got to watch for that constantly. According to the creationist, 6,000 years ago God did it. According to the evolutionist, 20 billion years ago it just happened by itself. Now, these two timelines are not the same scale. On the top timeline here, every inch is a 150 years, which is a long time. Abe Lincoln was not even president one inch ago. Columbus was running around trying to find this place right there. Vikings were going around beating up on everybody right there, right? If I was to try to show you what 20 billion years looks like at this scale, this chart would actually need to be 2,100 miles long from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. 6,000 years does not even show up on that chart. I cannot draw a line thin enough to represent 6,000 years. So they're hiding behind long ago and far away. <laughs> and if somehow the brain can't accept that. The brain shuts off and says, wow, it must be true. And if you tell, tell a big lie, they're more likely to believe it. And that's exactly what's happened. Now, the basic questions that you need to ask are, where did the matter come from? Where did the laws come from? And where did the energy come from? I ask that to evolutionists all the time. Okay, you say there was a big bang. Please tell, help me now. Where did the matter come from? What exploded? They don't know, of course. Secondly, where did the laws come from? Notice the universe is run by laws. The law of gravity, for instance. Why do objects attract each other? <coughs> How does the earth know my pen is here? If I drop it, how long will it take the earth to figure out where it is and start pulling on it? Instantly, right? How did it know that? If I was somehow able to create something instantly from nothing in the middle of the air, a hundred miles above the earth, how long would it take to begin falling? Where did this, what, what is gravity anyway? Give me a jar of it, would you please? Nobody has a clue what it is. We use it all the time, obviously, or you'd be sitting on the ceiling or something. But we don't, oh, nobody knows what it is, and we sort of don't know what, why do we have this interesting force called gravity, or inertia. 
or centrifugal force. I mean, there are hundreds of forces in the universe. Where did they come from? Who made them? And why are they so precise? Thirdly, where did all this energy come from? Energy and matter are sort of interchangeable, but anytime you change from one to the other, you have a tremendous loss. So basically, where did the matter, where did the energy come from? It's sort of two sides of the same coin. But these are things the evolutionist simply doesn't know. I use the merry-go-round illustration in my seminar uh, this, because it illustrates something called the conservation of, law of conservation of angular momentum. If you put kids on the merry-go-round and get it spinning, as it goes faster and faster and faster, eventually, of course, the kids are going to go flying off the merry-go-round. Now, when the kid flies off, if the merry-go-round is going clockwise, the kid will be spinning clockwise as he exits. The reason for this is, if you can imagine the circle spinning, the outside has to move faster than the inside. It's got further to go in the same amount of time. And because of that, if it cracks up in a frictionless environment, now that's key, okay, this would only work in a frictionless environment. And that's what the Big Bang Theory says, all the matter was in one dot. Well, if all the matter is in one dot, then you have a totally frictionless environment. There's nothing for it to hit on the way out. So if and they said it was spinning and it exploded. Well, then all of the fragments should be spinning the same way. But yet they're not. Venus and Uranus and possibly Pluto, they're not quite sure yet, last I heard, they don't know for sure which way Pluto spins, but they think it may be spinning backwards to the other six. Here we have six planets spinning one way, two and possibly three spinning the other way. And it's not just two planets together, Venus and Uranus have several planets in between. So why do two planets spin backwards? One atheist I debated said, well, maybe something hit Venus and spun it around backwards. I said, well, I suppose that's possible, but now think about it for a minute. Do you realize what it would take to reverse the spin of a planet? Don't you think it would leave a dent at least? <laughs> Where is the dent? Why is Venus nearly perfectly round and near in a nearly perfectly circular orbit? Imagine a planet spinning and at the same time going around the sun. I want you to strike it so that it simply reverses the spin without knocking it into an elliptical orbit or knocking it out of orbit. <coughs> Chances of that is zero. That ain't going to happen. Then not only do we have that problem, we have at least six of the 63 moons. I think there are more moons now that have been discovered. But at this time, there were in 1989, they knew about 63 moons. Six of them are spinning backwards. Some of them actually travel backwards around their planet. I believe, I'd have to look it up, but two planets, yeah, Saturn and Neptune, there it is right there, have moons orbiting both directions. Here you got a planet. Some of the moons are going this way. Other moons are going this way. Now, as these moons pass each other, there's going to be a slight gravitational tug. How long can a system like that last before it slowly disintegrates? They drift off into space. Certainly not forever. You'd agree with that, right? Is there some kind of time limit here? I don't know what it is, but I would think logic would say, yeah, there's an obvious time limit. Can't be, it can't have happened for billions of years. So if, I, if somebody says the universe was created 6,000 years ago by an all-wise creator, well, then this is no problem. Stuff like this poses no problem for the creationist, but I think it does for those who want to say it's billions and billions of years old. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and in the book of Psalms, identical verse, part of the verse, says the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Might be a good bonus question if you can find out which psalm says the heavens shall pass away. Um, So the New Testament writer here is quoting an Old Testament verse about the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth shall be burned up. Jehovah's Witnesses teach the earth is going to last forever. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So these guys teaching the earth is going to last forever simply don't read their Bible. They're wrong. All right? So. This is the Big Bang in the Bible, the great noise. 
If somebody says, do you believe in the Big Bang? I say, oh, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. The Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> it's coming, folks. Get ready. Now, the Big Bang theory has some serious problems. First of all, it does not explain where the matter came from. It does not explain where the energy came from. It does not explain where the laws came from. It does not explain why we have retro, what's called retrograde motion. Another problem with the Big Bang that they've really tried to avoid is the fact that if there were a Big Bang, the matter should be fairly evenly distributed throughout space. But it's not. It is clumpy. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff together called a galaxy, and in zillions of miles and nothing. How much space is there between here and Mars, for instance? What, about 45 million miles at the closest? Between here and the sun, 93 million miles, roughly. There's a whole lot of nothing, folks. Just plain nothing. Big Bang Theory should have everything evenly distributed, and it just simply isn't that way. There's a great article in Creation Magazine, December 99, about the physics behind the Big Bang, how it just can't be true. By the way, if you want to really get a fascinating magazine, to, it only comes once every th uh, three months, and it's 22 bucks a year, so you get four copies. Well worth it, though. Creation Magazine, I'll give you a number you can call if you want to get that. Awesome articles, just w very well done. It's 800-350-3232. Uh, That'd be a magazine well worth subscribing to, 800-350-3232. That's up in, uh, they're published in Australia, actually. Creation Ex Nihilo is the name of it. And the back issues are like five bucks each, and they've been doing this since, well, ten years. If you really want to get a tremendous library, you, you could spend $100 probably and get all of the back issues. And just, or maybe $200 or something. It's just really, really good stuff in there. Enough to read for a long time. But that article is, uh, it to goes into the science behind the Big Bang Theory. It's just a big dud. The second law of thermodynamics, and we must hurry here, says everything is tending toward disorder. Now, there are several different ways this is phrased, okay? Some people say, uh, in any exchange, there's a net loss. You know, several ways this is, this is phrased. All right. Who can define thermodynamics? Tanya, heat power. Very good. Heat power. Um, What is another more uh, common term for cosmic evolution? Big bang. Big bang. Cameraman, Eric. All right, sorry about that. Let's see, the origin of life would be which one? Organic, Organic evolution. A crazy, there we go, all right. Uh, let's see, the origin of uh, time space matter would be. Cosmic evolution, Big Bang. There we go, okay. <laughs> when was the Humanist Manifesto first written, the first one? 1933. 33. There we go. Got several got that one. 1933. Oh, oh, that's over there, end of the table. Don't eat that. Okay. Um, the word universe means Single spoken sentence, universe. There we go. All right. Did you, get, you didn't get that one, did you? Steve got it. Universe, single spoken sentence. Uh, how many times did Lucifer say, I will? Five, Five times. Oh, hey, everybody got one. Go give everybody one, okay? Give them one. Just one. I just want to whet their appetite, okay? What is the Bible word that means the enlightened one? Lucifer. Lucifer. Very good. Right there. He got it right there at the end of that table. Okay. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics tells us basically it boils down to what it means is if you leave something alone for a while, it's either going to rot or rust or die or fall apart or break down. Absolutely nothing improves with time. Everything is disintegrating. Disintegrating. Just take a look in the mirror and you will see, okay? <laughs> Wrinkles, <laughs> things just fall apart, right? Now, the Bible teaches that in Hebrews chapter 1. The heavens are the works of thy hands, they shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. I believe this is also 
repeating one of the Psalms, if you want to find that one. There's an Old Testament reference that the New Testament author is simply reiterating what he said. Everything is basically wearing out. It'll wax old as doth a garment. Garments gradually wear out. The fibers slowly eat against each other and fragments fly off and make dust and pretty soon it's real thin and then pretty soon it, it falls apart. The universe is falling apart. Um, this happens, you can see it, you can observe everything getting worse with time. Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. You'll see what I'm talking about. Maybe you fellas can help me. I've been trying to figure something out for a long time. I've been married 27 years now. My daughter's 20. Why does it take the girls an hour of hard work in the morning in order to look natural? <laughs> if you're trying to look natural, get up and go to work. <laughs> That's natural, right? <laughs> no, that nobody wants to look natural. You don't want to smell natural either, do you? <laughs> That's why we have whole sections of the store to sell stuff to overcome the second law of thermodynamics. Did you know nearly everybody in the world is employed because of the second law of thermodynamics? You are either fixing something that somebody else made because it's wearing out now and breaking, or you're building a new something because the last one broke. Right? Really, if you think about it, that law employs just about the entire population of the world. We have to work. To just to maintain. If you don't exercise, go work out. Your second law of thermodynamics will take over, won't it? <laughs> one guy said, I'm a bodybuilder. I'm building a big one. Look at this. <laughs> um, that's just a fact of science, folks. Everything's falling apart. But I want you to see what the textbook says. HBJ Earth Science says, humans probably evolved from bacteria. Now hold it just a minute. Which of the six meanings of evolution would that be? Macro, changing from one kind to another. Has anybody ever observed that? No. Bacteria are still having babies, and they're bacteria, right? Humans have humans. Cats have cats. Nothing's ever been observed to indicate this is true. But this is, gonna, this is in a probably an eighth or ninth grade earth science book where they tell the kids, humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than four billion years ago. Now, in this book, they stretched it to 4 billion. As we go through the course, I'll show you lots of different textbooks. The number ranges all over from 3 billion to 4 billion. Now, if the universe began 4.6 billion years ago, by the way, in 1905, you can look it up in an old encyclopedia, they officially say the Earth is 2 billion years old. Just 100 years ago, they were saying it's 2 billion years old. Now they're saying it's 4.6 billion years old. Guess what it'll be in another 50 years? Something bigger, bigger number, right? <laughs> the solution is always add more time. Back in 1770, they were saying it is 70,000 years old. The Earth is getting older, about 21 million years per minute, I believe. It's gaining, <laughs> getting old fast. Um, this textbook shows the kids a fossil starfish, and it says, Nearly 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Was your great, 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 great grandpa a starfish? Isn't this answering the question, where did, where did I come from? Not very well, <laughs> but that's what they're trying to answer, isn't it? Evolution is a religion that seeks to answer the four great questions of life. Where did I come from? Oh, I came from a starfish. Look at this one. 30 million years ago, I stop right there. I say, kids, let me translate that for you. What that really means is long ago and far away. It means a fairy tale is coming next. That's your warning <laughs> right there. Fairy tale coming up. 30 million years ago, these creatures evolved. Now, there's that word again. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Now, hold on a minute. <coughs> Apes are still having babies, aren't they? Why don't they produce another human? Only oh, this time, let's watch it. See how it happens long ago and far away, but it can't happen in the present? They're hiding behind something that cannot be observed. It's not science. What they're saying is, that's grandpa. Now, well, subconsciously, what does this do to the kid? Well, I'm just an animal. 
So if I have animal instincts, it's normal, it's natural. Can you see how this ties in? Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She's a liberal journalist. Your kids go ape in school, here's why. Right there, she said, he's being taught evolution. Johnny, you're an animal. Uh, really? This book used right here. Washington High School uses it. Tate High School uses it. Uh, Pensacola High School uses it. That book right now, they're using it now. You are an animal. Share a common heritage with earthworms. Oh, you mean I'm just an animal? Huh, okay. <laughs> and you wonder. Some of them make you wonder, don't they, you know? Here we sit back and wonder, why do the kids act like animals? Well, look what you're teaching them. And then the idiot news, when some kid shoots another kid in school, which is happening all the time these days, last week, they jump on the gun control issue, don't they? They're trying to focus the attention away from the real problem, which is what we're teaching them. You ought to get some of the school books, or some of the articles about the ten most common problems in school in 1870. Chewing gum. Late to class. What were the teachers list now as the ten most common problems? Guns in school. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is all part of the plan, folks. There's a much bigger plan behind all this. Uh, the whole purpose of public education, free government education, was Karl Marx's idea. 1846 or 48, the Communist Manifesto. He gave 10 things to do to destroy a country, to make it communist. Number 10 on his list was free government education. Nine or 10. We're going to look at it. We get into more of that in video number five, how this ties together. But we teach the kids they're an animal, and we stand back and marvel that they act like animals. If a kid thinks, you know, I'm made in God's image, and I'm going to stand before God someday, that may not stop him from doing every crime, but it'll sure help, don't you think? It can't hurt. Now, there have been a lot of horrible things done in the name of Christianity and in the name of various religions. I'm aware of all that. Okay. But if you tell all the kids there is no creator, you will never be judged for anything that you do. All he's got to do is figure out a way to get by. He's got to be more clever. That's all. Folks, this philosophy is so dangerous. Next week, we're going to talk about teachers can teach creation science in a public school. I spoke in five public schools last week. Perfectly fine to speak in, or two weeks ago. Perfectly fine to, fine to teach the Bible in public schools and teach creation in public schools. We'll cover that in the next lesson. Thank you so much. Dismissed.